2023 City of Portland Planning Commission. I am calling the meeting to order. I am the chair, Mary Rain O'Mara. I'm joined here in person by Commissioner Alexander, Commissioner Spivak, Commissioner Patel, and virtually we have Commissioner Ling and Vice Chair Pouncil joining us. Today we have a hearing and briefing on the housing needs analysis. And we have a briefing on the housing regulatory relief recommendations. Um, I will start by asking if there are any items of interest from commissioners. Great. Commissioner Steve, go ahead. Mary Rain, this is um, Erica Thompson. I'm joining virtually. Okay. I am having some problems with my camera, but I'm working on it. Okay, noted. Thank you, Vice Chair Thompson. Thank you, it's nice to be here in person. Um, one of my other volunteer hats, I'm the co-founder of Electrify PDX and the Families for Climate. And we are hosting a festival on October 7th at The Red in Inner East High Portland. Thank you for both BPS for being a sponsor along with the county and Sam Barrasso for speaking along with Their Day and Community Energy Project and other organizations. Um, the idea is to make this fun, help Portlanders figure out how they can transition their home, whether they're renting or owning to a low carbon footprint. And it's gonna be a electric tailgate party, induction cooking demonstrations, um, clever cycles, electric ride opportunities, two bouncy castles, free ice cream sandwiches, um, and cookouts with beignets. So we're gonna really try and make it fun. But in addition to education, like 30 plus contractors there to help you with anything you need. And sign up for community solar on the spot if you haven't already. So I hope people will join us. Thanks. Great, sounds like fun. Thank you, Commissioner Spivak. Patricia, do you have a director's report or any announcements for commission today? Good evening, Chair, Commissioners. Patricia Diefendorfer, uh, Bureau of Planning and Sustainability, Chief Planner. Just a quick announcement as a reminder that um, the next Planning Commission meeting on October 10th is going to be an evening meeting, just to make sure, because that is typically our daytime meeting, but to accommodate a public hearing that is scheduled for that uh, meeting, we. Um, move the meeting to an evening meeting so that the public can participate. So that's really all I wanted to kind of just uh, give that reminder. And with that, I think that concludes my report for now. Thank you. Thank you, Patricia. And acknowledging that Commissioner Routh is also joining virtually. Hello, welcome. Um, so moving on to our consent agenda. This is a consideration of minutes from the September 12th Planning Commission meeting. Is there a motion to approve the September 12th Planning Commission meeting minutes? Okay. I will happily move. Okay, I think Commissioner Alexander was first. Uh, Commissioner Routh, would you like to second? I'd love it. Wonderful. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay, the motion carries. We will proceed now to the housing needs analysis. Calling up staff Tom Armstrong, Ariel Kane, I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Please correct me if that's wrong, and Sam Brookham. And this is a public hearing, so staff will give a brief presentation and then I will open up the meeting for oral testimony. We do have um, several testifiers signed up for both in-person and online testimony. So we will proceed to that after staff presentation. And we will be keeping this hearing open through October 10th. Great, welcome. Can you hear me? Is that working? Okay, great. Good evening, I'm uh, Tom Armstrong. I'm a supervising planner with BPS. I manage the housing and economic policy team. And with me tonight is... Uh, my name is Ariel Kane. Uh, Thank you, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, there we go. Okay, good. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, Ariel Kane, an economic planner on Tom's team at the Bureau of Planning and Sustainability. Hello, everybody. Uh, Sam Brookham, also an economic planner with BPS. All 
All right, we have a uh, presentation here to give you an overview of the housing needs analysis. Um, if we can get that queued up. I should be. So I can start with a little bit of an overview and introductory remarks. Um, so the housing needs analysis <clears throat> is a state requirement. Um, it's uh, under goal 10 is the housing goal. Um, and cities are required to show that they have the capacity to accommodate at least 20 years of, of forecasted growth. And so we go through this process to look at what, what is that forecast, what are those expectations, and then parallel to that, we do the buildable land inventory that is where do we have room to grow. And we'll go through both of those pieces of it tonight. This is a what we call a, a background document to the comprehensive plan. So it, it sits below the, the goals and policies um, as a separate uh, document, but it is a, a what we sometimes refer to as a factual base. Um, when we point to, um, you know, in other decisions, such as, you know, what you'll hear tonight about the, the uh, residential regulatory relief project that if a project like that or a zoning map project affects the housing capacity, um, we have to show that we continue to have capacity to meet that future growth. If, if for example, like in the floodplain project or the E-zone project that would reduce housing capacity, you, we sort of do the accounting to continue to show that we have enough capacity to meet future growth. And that, that really is be, the needs analysis and the buildable land inventory really become that factual base where we do that accounting um, there. Okay. I need to screen share. <laughs> <laughs> There we go. Oh. Hang on a second. Yeah. Did you switch them? Swap them. All right, okay. Okay. All right. So, so um, eventually here, over the next three meetings, um, we're looking for your recommendation to repeal the old housing needs analysis that we did as part of the comp plan update way back in 2009 as an early piece to this and adopt the new housing needs analysis. And then with the buildable land inventory, we want, we would like you to repeal the residential portion of the old buildable land inventory and adopt a new um, residential buildable land inventory. What we uh, have in, before you in your agenda packet was a combined buildable land inventory that had both the residential and the employment pieces to it. We're going to adopt the employment pieces later in 2024 when we bring the, the economic opportunities analysis um, to you. So what we're going to do is is split that document into a residential portion and an employment portion. Um, we're going to publish that uh, residential standalone residential document on Friday. Um, and so because we're creating a slightly different document, it has the same information, but we want to keep the record open and keep the testimony open. Give folks anybody who wants to look at that residential one and think about it more and come back on the 10th um, for additional public testimony if there is any. Um, so 
that's the slight change to to how we would like to proceed with these recommendations. Um, as I explained, you know, this is a supporting document, um, you know, that that to the the comprehensive plan itself. At this point in time, we're not proposing any um, changes to the the uh, goals and policies in Chapter Five, the the housing chapter. Um, that might be something that comes up um, in the next phase of this project, um, if you go on. So, um, so with the, the needs analysis, um, and as you saw, we did this back in 2009, um, the state with recent legislation over the last couple of years has, has been um, ratcheting up the requirements on cities for these housing needs analysis. And the new requirements are um, that we're gonna do this every six years and every three years that midterm, we're gonna do a progress report to the state um, to, to see how we're doing. And, and you know, are we growing the way we thought we would grow? What kind of housing are we producing? Um, is it meeting the needs uh, that we identified? What, what is the affordability trends? What are the development trends? Um, and so we're gonna get into a regular cycle with this to just talk about housing in general and housing production and demographic change um, in Portland. And so as, as part of the, the state requirements, they, they break this up into two pieces. And, and what's before you tonight is the housing needs analysis, which are what I like to call are the numbers and so we'll present some information and you will see in the documents some information on existing conditions and recent trends, um, both in terms of the population and the, and, um, the housing development. Um, we use those, that information to inform our forecasted housing need um, and to inform our buildable land inventory. And we'll get into some of those details on, on how that the past trends inform our future assumptions. And out of that, we develop a, a, a needed housing. Um, and, and you'll see you know, how we split that up. The new requirement for all of this is the housing production strategy. And so once we settle on the numbers and the need and, and our sort of production target, we're gonna go through a process that gets at, well, how are we actually gonna produce these units and, and what kind of programs and incentives and investments can we do to realize and, and help support the development of that. And that's what we really are gonna get into um, later this year and into 2024. And that, that's sort of phase two of this project. And that's where we begin to identify future zoning projects, future code projects. And, and this really is given that six year cycle with the state it's really like a five-year action plan. And what, what are all the, the things that we could do to support housing growth in the right locations um, in Portland? And so this, is, this tonight is the first of, of a continuing conversation about housing and housing production in, in Portland. And so now I'm gonna turn it over to Ariel, who's um, gonna give us some background information on uh, both recent trends as well as the household forecast. Great, thank you. So as Tom mentioned, we use existing conditions to inform uh, the forecast. Uh, we start off by looking at the most recent available American Community Surveys data, which is based on 2021, so it doesn't totally encapsulate all of the COVID-19 impacts in our demographic changes. However, um, we know in 2021, we had about 650,000 people, 280,000 households, and about 300,000 housing units in Portland. Um, we see some changes have happened from 2010 to 2021. We've seen an increase, oh, thank you. Uh, we've seen an increase in our BIPOC populations, more than a third of our um, population identified as BIPOC. Uh, we also are seeing an increase in our aging population. We're also seeing an increase in households with people with disabilities. We're seeing a slight decrease in our households with children, um, and we're seeing a shift in the share of our homeowners. Um, we're also seeing 
um, that our household size is changing a little bit, but we're seeing an increase in the number of households that are one or two, but we're seeing sort of a decrease in the share. Um, so the number is sort of negligible. That's why it's sort of across the board here. Um, and so this information is useful in understanding where we are now and also will help us sort of look at those future um, forecasting numbers and understand um, what kind of housing we think we might need in the future. So on the next slide, um, it's a little hard to see here, so I hope it's better online. Uh, but this is um, the Housing Bureau's 2022 State of Housing Report, where they highlight that while a third of our population is BIPOC, uh, most areas within our community in Portland are not affordable to um, Black, Latin A, or Native American renter households. And when we look at this on the flip side for homeownership, we see similar trends that um, there's still um, a large portion of our um, community that is out of, out of reach affordability-wise. So here you can interpret that a two-bedroom household that is green, uh, census tract that is green, um, is affordable, whereas a two-bedroom household in the blue tracks are not affordable. Um, <clears throat> and so uh, just to clarify what this means, this also means that about a household that wanted to rent in this area it, to be considered affordable would be paying less than 30% of their income on their rent. Um, and the same for ho homeowners, less than 30% would be spent on uh, mortgage and their other owner costs. Okay, on the next slide, we start to get into the 2045 housing forecast. And as Tom mentioned, we use sort of these existing conditions to understand the baseline. We start from 2021 and we look forward towards 2045, utilizing the Metro Distributed Forecast, which was produced in 2019. So again, doesn't totally show the COVID-19 impacts um, and the change that's happening, um, but it still sets the stage for understanding how much housing we need um, in 2045. Um, additionally, we utilized the Oregon Housing Needs Analysis drafted methodology uh, to come up with these numbers. Uh, this number, these are not um, yet put into um, rulemaking, so we don't have to use these numbers, but we're utilizing them to show um, the depth of the need and the different factors that go into understanding our future housing need. Um, Using the 2019 Metro Distributed Forecast, that first number that you see, the 97,471, is our base. That's how much Metro anticipates Portland will be growing from 2021 to 2045 by households. Um, we also add in a vacancy factor if we want to maintain a healthy vacancy so that there's opportunity and choice for households as they move through their life cycle or new households move here. Um, what additional uh, units do we need to produce? So that adds in that 8,287 uh, new housing units. We also account for vacation homes over the next 20 years, um, how many homes will be lost to vacation home usage or rent, uh, vacation rental usage because we know those aren't true vacancies. Uh, so that adds in another 813 additional housing units that we would want to plan for. All of that rolling up into 106,571 needed housing units by 2045. We additionally, um, one of the new things from the ONA methodology is wanting to account for underproduction. If we had been keeping up with producing um, the national rate of production to uh, household formation, what would we have produced between 2010 and 2021? So that's this historical underproduction. If we had been keeping pace, we would have added these 9,385 units. Um, but to make up for that, we have added this into the 2045 forecast. And then the last number that we add in is accounting for our existing acute need for our existing houseless households. We start with the point in time count uh, for houseless households, and that's around two, I think it's 2,600 in Multnomah County, but we add a multiplier effect because we know it's well established that that's an undercount of our houseless households. So that brings us up to another 4,604 houseless ho households that we would want to be planning to house. So that puts us up from that 97,471 units up to 120,560 new units. Um, that's an annual production target from 2021 to 2045 of 5,242 units. 
I believe in 2022, that was around the amount of units we produced. Um, so it is possible, um, though we have been seeing changes in our production rates. Um, and then lastly, one of the things that we're considering is uh, Governor Kotek's housing production strategy um, statewide. And so if we wanted to put, if we wanted to catch up and sort of produce those missing units over the next nine years, um, by 2032, we would want to produce about 55,000 of those 120,000 units um, to sort of meet her targets as well. That increases from the 5,200 units per year to about 6,000 units per year needing to produce um, between now and 2032. I think I can go on to the next slide. Um, so one other thing that we consider in the housing needs analysis and is required by the Department of Land Conservation and Development is the affordability to our households of those units. Um, so we anticipate growth at all income levels and we start with that base of the 2021 distribution of area median income. So lower income households currently make up about 47% of Portland's households. And then when we add in those under production units, as well as the houseless households um, in count being accounted for, that increases from 47% to 53% of our um, units needing to be produced to that lower income housing affordability range. So 80% area median income or below. Uh, for context, in 2023, 100% um, AMI for a household of four is considered 114,000, and an affordable housing cost would be about $3,200 a month, and an affordable house to purchase would be $390,000. At the 60% AMI level, a family of four would earn about $68,000 a year, and affordable monthly housing cost would be $1,900 per month. Um, Additionally, we also want to meet the needs of various household types and their accessibility needs. So we're also looking at other types of needed housing as well. On the next slide, we'll see um, similar to what I showed you of the existing conditions. We are wanting to um, we are wanting to account for these different types of changes that are happening in our community as well as the different um, household formations. So we want to be able to keep an account for our families that move here or families that are growing here. So we would hope that um, of the new units, we want to produce about 23% of those or would be um, two bedrooms or larger uh, units. We also want to be able to account for our aging population. As we saw, we're becoming an older community. And so we want um, to see at least or around uh, 27,000 or 23% of our housing units accommodate our aging population in their households. Additionally, we want to be able to accommodate our community members who have disabilities. And so we would consider um, that we would want 22% of those units to also be able to meet the accessibility needs of our community. Um, these are not stackable numbers per se. We know that there's intersectionality between these different groups. We know families will have accessibility needs. We know old aging population will have accessibility needs. Um, and we know they fall across the in income spectrum as well. And then lastly, we don't quite forecast home ownership, but we also understand that we want to create opportunities for wealth building in our community. And so home ownership opportunities, while not addressed here, we are keeping an eye on and thinking towards the future of how to create more home ownership opportunities in the units we're producing. Um, and then with that, that sort of wraps up our forecast or expected demand from now to 2045. And Sam will talk a little bit more about the supply side. Hey everybody. Um, yeah, as Ariel mentioned, I'm going to be talking about the supply side and the way we talk about the supply um, compared to the demand is through buildable lands. And so we've conducted a buildable lands inventory analysis uh, to, to determine where the supply of our buildable land is throughout the city. Um, technically, what that means is, uh, you know, what the BLI means is, is it's really an assessment of that of the development capacity of that land. So we factor in things like development constraints um, and market trends to actually get to that um, sort of realistic market figure. Um, and we're looking at that through the lens of, you know, what we need for housing and employment through 2045. So there's a, 
there's a bit of a new methodology that we're using this time around. And we've, you know, we last time we did a build rule lands inventory was in 2016, um, where we looked at vacant land. We took an inventory of vacant land that hasn't changed. Um, that's pretty consistent. Um, and uh, then we, this time around, we've looked at redevelopable land, and redevelopable land um, is determined through a pro forma feasibility analysis. So we've done that to kind of give it a market lens, market based lens, to look at redevelopable um, parcels of land through a uh, through a uh, you know how a developer would actually go about looking at that land. Um, back in 2016, we really just looked at the underutilization of um, capacity, really allowed zoning capacity, which isn't necessarily you know market, you know market feasible, market realistic. Um, so that's a big change. Um, combine those two things together: the vacant land and the redevelopable land gives us um, our kind of base supply, to which we can calculate gross development capacity. Um, and by gross development capacity, I mean capacity before we factor in things like constraints and what's there now. Um, and so in order to get to our kind of net new development capacity, we, we factor in those development constraints, anything from, you know, substandard transportation infrastructure to steep slopes, the brownfields and, you know, RE, um, RP and Z C zones and other environmental constraints. There are 26 of them in total. Um, and then uh, because this is a um, you know, we can we can only look at what's on the ground now um, and look forward. Um, we're incorporating the re our recent development as kind of realized capacity, right? Because the the base year of this analysis, the H and A, is twenty twenty one. And then all things factored in together, that gets us our net new development capacity. I'm going to uh, just focus in on that that redevelopment um, feasibility analysis um, right now um, because you know there's a there's a there's a piece in there that um, that that matters a lot and that's the residual land value that's the the thing that this um, uh, pro forma analysis solves for a residual land value is um, the amount of, of of money a developer could spend on land and still have a um, you know theoretically viable project and so um, here you have an example of a roughly acre and a half square foot lot, um, oh sorry, <laughs> acre and a half lot, 70,000 square foot lot um, on Sandy Boulevard, it's CM3 zoning. Um, and we have these 16 prototypes that we, we're testing for. Um, and I faded back all the prototypes that don't fit within this zoning. Um, so you're left with um, basically apartments. Um, and the residual land value here um, that floats to the top um, um, is the kind of what we call a podium apartment two. And it's basically a five over two building. Um, and um, you know that's that's the that's the prototype from which we pull the capacity. Um, it's the highest. It just happens to be the highest density prototype in our in our model. Um, so that's resulting in two hundred and seventy two units of housing unit capacity. Um, so dialing this back, scaling back a little bit. Um, the results of uh, that entire BLI um, analysis um, can be seen on the uh, the right hand diagram here that's um, that's kind of our spatial distribution of our um, of our housing unit density throughout the city and you can see a significant cluster significant concentration in our central city um, as well as along um, some of our more prominent corridors and other centers like gateway interstate and others um, and that is that's in line um, with our growth strategy um, of centers and corridors, and that's that growth strategy can uh, that dates back to you know 1980s um, in our comprehensive plan. Um, it I mean it, it it is our growth strategy today, um, and it is uh, basically what that um, says is that the majority of our capacity is in areas of more walkable, transit-rich, amenity-rich. Um, uh, environments, um, areas of high opportunity.
there's a few figures on the slide here that um, shows how our total capacity, which is 237,000 housing units, so thinking back to uh, the number that Ariel put um, forth be before you, 120,000 units of housing demand over the next um, 20, 25 years, um, that residential capacity is obviously far greater than 120, it's almost double. Um, and how that's distributed uh, throughout various uh, geographies is, is right here. You can see that approximately 90% of our, um, our total housing unit capacity is in um, centers and corridors, um, again, in line with our, with our growth strategy. But also 76% of those units are in um, complete neighborhoods. When you look at it from a housing type perspective, 90% um, is in uh, multi-unit uh, buildings, so in tends to be in mixed use and uh, and multi dwelling zones. Um, but also we have um, approximately fourteen percent of our total capacity in our as as coming out as middle housing, um, almost as a direct result of the uh, uh, residential infill project. And those two numbers don't necessarily factor um, uh, match up those nineteen those fourteen percent um, because we are seeing a lot of um, middle housing. Um, being developed in our RM1, RM2 zones, so our lower density multi-dwelling zones. So there's a little bit of overlap. As I mentioned, there's a, uh, about twice our um, total need when you look at it citywide. Uh, when you look at it district by district, it gets a little tighter. The supply um, gets a little tighter in the uh, uh, north and northeast districts. Um, but generally speaking, um, the this excess capacity really gives us the opportunity to be um, they're st strategic in the way that, that we direct our growth um, and um, we are still seeing a, a significant market preference for for um, you know, places like Central City so um, here you have the the demand, the total need, the 120,000 units um, allocated by district uh, relative to the total supply. And as I mentioned, uh, the supply uh, is a little tighter in north and northeast, but we have we we seemingly have plenty a plentiful supply in in s central city, east, southeast, and west Portland. This allocation is based on housing production trends over the past 20 years, uh, and we actually will have a chance every three years to check in and see how the um, how that production is uh, materializing and, and and whether that production those production trends are are continuing and tracking with with what we've seen um, in the past. So we'll have a check a uh, uh, chance to sort of check in and reconfigure some of those. Uh, just to bring this back to again that sort of recent production level. Um, that 5,200 annual production target um, across uh, through 2045 um, is roughly in line with what we've seen um, our permitting activity uh, be over the past decade. Uh, we've, on average, anyway. Uh, post recession, mo the vast majority of our new housing production has been in multifamily. It's almost been 80% 80, 80%, I think, um, at least in the last few years. Uh, but we've seen an increase in mill housing since uh, since RIP went into effect, as well as some um, increasing ADU uh, accessory dwelling unit production in sort of mid mid 2010s. So, um, you know, we're we're roughly there. Um, obviously, um, you know, I think uh, just to drive that my, one of my previous points home. Um, you know, we have ex we have a lot of excess capacity. Uh, the you know the the, the trend is um, roughly in line with recent production, um, but we do have a significant opportunity to um, to to drive growth um, uh, that's in line with you know where, where our needs. So with that, I'm going to pass it back to Tom. Okay, just just a little bit about. Um, sort of the next phase, what I talked about, the housing production strategy. Um, as I said, you know, once we establish the need and, and as you saw here, you know, the range of needs, the need for accessible housing or housing for elders, we get in deeper into each of those to figure out, well, how, how are, what can we do to encourage more home, home ownership? And 
the state outlines these different categories, um, you know, that range from the financial side to the zoning side um, and permitting side. And so, um, next slide, please. Where where we're 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 looking at this sort of from two directions. Um, one with the income categories what are the tools or the policies and programs that the city has to apply to to support the housing development and and certain tools are are really available or effective at um for those different income levels and you know the lower income housing affordable housing permanently affordable housing has really been uh reliant on public funding that's where the metro and the city bonds have gone to the set asides from our urban renewal areas. Um, as we get up the income stream, then you know we've been able to offer different incentives. At the city, those have rarely gone beyond the the eighty percent income level. Um, a few of the home ownership uh, tax abatements get, go a little higher into the one hundred and one hundred and twenty um, income percent income level. And then really, and and this a lot of this comes to what what we have control over is the zoning and the development codes and and those affect all types of housing and um, i think you will hear as part of the regulatory relief project the affordable housing developers encountering the same code issues as the pro for-profit developers do um, and so how you know looking at the various zoning tools that we have um, and then the other city programs around infrastructure and, and system development charges. That affects housing across the board. Next slide, please. And so when we bring this forward, what where we're starting with is just looking at everything that we are doing already and, um, and what we're working on right now, which is a lot. Um, and then going through a process of, of a discussion both within the city and the city bureaus and with you and with council and with the community about what programs that we're doing now are working and that we really need to double down on and, and enhance. And, and what are some of the other things that are out there uh, that other cities are doing that we're not doing right now that we might want to bring in to, a, to our strategy, our production strategy. Um, and really sort of revisit some of these things that we're doing, see how we could do better, and then what new policy tools, new programs could we bring um, to the table over the next five years uh, to support that, that housing production. Next slide, please. So just uh, real briefly, we, we have the, the hearing, public hearing tonight. Um, uh, and I said, we'll continue that over to October 10th. I think after you hear testimony tonight, we can come back up. Um, we're interested in your questions. We can dug, dig deeper um, into issues. We can bring back research and, and more information to our meeting on October 10th, which will be your work session. And so we'll have more time to, to dig into some of these numbers and, and issues on October 10th. And then, um, to keep us on schedule to have council to adopt this in December, um, where we would be looking for your recommendation at your October 24th meeting. And then into 2024, we'll be back with the, the production strategy discussion. And I think that concludes our presentation for this evening. Thank you for that presentation and overview. I'll now be opening up for oral testimony. And I know we do have several um, individuals signed up. We'll start with the in-person testifiers. And so I have in order here, Peter Fry and then Michael Anderson as our two signed up for in-person. Please come on up to the dais. Thanks for being here. Um, each testifier does have three minutes and we have our color coded lights here to, to help you um, with your three minute allotment. The yellow light means 30 seconds and red is when your time is up. And then after we have the in-person testimony, we'll go ahead and transition to the online. And just as a heads up for online, I have Lisa Maddox, Jennifer Such and Joe Costello as the first three for the online. Okay, and with that, welcome Peter Fry.
please turn on your mic and um, introduce yourself. State your name for the record. It's uh, Peter. It's Peter Finley Fry. Is my mic on? Thank you. I'm speaking on my own behalf. I've been a certified land use planner for quite a few years in Portland. And this is a cr incredibly important project that we're involved in. And one of the reasons I'm here is because this issue has been so politicized that I don't really think at the political policy level, people have an understanding of what's going on. And what you're doing now is providing the factual base. And in terms of the factual base, I had two things to offer two more research areas. And one is uh, looking at the new high density residential zoning versus the old high density residential zoning, looking at what projects were built in the new versus the old, and seeing if we're getting a lot more density because we fundamentally changed the way we calculated uh, units four years ago. The other thing is actually more important important to me, and that is to look at what is really going on. I mean, we keep calling household units, household units. I look at it as a home, not a household unit. A household unit is somewhere someone flops and spends the night and goes on. Home is where you create wealth. And when I call wealth, I'm talking about marriage, children, a place to be, landscaping, gardens, all the things that you create over time, a legacy. And so we don't really understand how the household unit works. So I'm asking the Planning Bureau to investigate that, to actually look at the household units and see what is actually going on in that unit. How many bedrooms are actually being used? In my office built area, large condo project, at least a third of the units are empty or being used for vacation. They're, they're real, they're occupied, but they're not being occupied by people. And so I'm asking that you investigate some of these places and look at what is going on in that house. How many bedrooms are actually vacant? Uh, Homer Williams said there's a million vacant bedrooms in the state. I don't know if that's true or not. Um, okay, so that's here now for this project now. And before I run out of time, I see I am running out of time, I wanted to push forward to see what future holds. And you'll see in my letter, I'm talking about market-based solutions like master leasing, mortgage guarantee programs, down payment grants, sumable loans, public infrastructure. What I'm trying to avoid is developers stealing land for free, basically, because you allow urban growth boundaries expand and you use cheap land to build your housing on, that is not uh, appropriate. Uh, the last point I guess I want to make, because I think I ran out of time, is I think we also have to look at the issue of future population, because we're experiencing a huge diversification of culture. So we're dealing with different family units in the classic Northern European you know, two parents, three kids. We're talking about ex extended families and we're talking about generational household units. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your testimony. I'm sorry, I should have got up to me. I hate bad questions. <laughs> Michael Anderson, go ahead. Okay, thank you. Chair Amira, commissioners, my name is Michael Anderson. I'm a senior housing researcher with Sightline Institute. We're a regional sustainability think tank. Sightline's housing program is built on the fact that when people choose to live closer to each other, they voluntarily cut their energy use roughly in half. But energy use is just one of the many things at stake in this housing needs analysis. That's why I'm here today with others to say, as the city identifies strategies for meeting housing need, it should formally consider the effects of broadly legalizing small scale apartment buildings, four floors and corner stores, throughout the closer in high opportunity neighborhoods that surround the central city. As the draft HNA lays out, Portland has about twice as much zoned capacity citywide as it needs to meet its projected growth. That's not a problem. The more zoned capacity we give ourselves, the more housing choice we have, the more flexibility we have for our different possible futures. The trouble is that so much of our zoned capacity is in the wrong place for some of our best futures. It's alongside freeways, more than a third of it. It's in neighborhoods that fear gentrification, it's in brownfields that cost tens of millions of dollars just to prepare for development. 
Then there's affordability. If you turn to page 58 of your draft HNA, you'll see this startling fact. In the entire city, more than half of the unregulated affordable homes, the inexpensive older plexes and apartments, sit in a fairly small yellow zone of neighborhoods around the central city, no further east than 60th Avenue. The city accurately designates these as high opportunity neighborhoods. Many were down zoned in the 1980s, partly a political reaction to the construction of those inexpensive apartments. Because of those down zones, many of these older apartments now sit on apartment zones that jut into areas of only lower density zoning. By allowing apartments through the rest of these walkable inner neighborhoods, Portland could take pressure off its older apartments. The new buildings, meanwhile, could be built mixed income thanks to inclusionary zoning and other publicly funded affordable housing. By making, lots, by making more lots available for LITEX scale development, this change would accelerate Portland's production of below market homes while prices would go lower in our existing stock. This change would let our, all our inner neighborhoods evolve in the same way that Buckman or Boise or the Northwest District were once allowed to. It would diversify neighborhoods economically, reduce energy use, boost economic growth, and reduce dependence on cars. At the very least, Portland should include it on the table among its housing production options. Thanks. Thank you for your testimony. We'll now transition to online. Yeah, we have um, one person who signed up oh, online who's here. Welcome. Come on up and please state your name for the record. Sure. Hi there, I'm Bradley Bondi. I'm a resident of Flint. And let me just pull this on hip. Hi there. Uh, so I just wanted to uh, implore staff members and members of the commission uh, to not treat the growth, the growth projections given to us by Metro as like a divine gospel. Uh, projecting population trends into the future is fuzzy and imprecise, and there is a ton of factors outside of our control that could see the growth exceed those projections. Um, take as an example that since uh, Trump took office in 2015, uh, prior to uh, Metro uh, creating these projections, uh, the U.S. has had a historically low rate of immigration. and I don't think it's unreasonable to expect the federal government to reform that immigration back to something more in line with historical trends. Uh, it's not a given to be sure, but that's a thing. We have no way of knowing. And so we should plan with a certain amount of uncertainty in mind. Uh, if we were to treat Metro's projections as a target rather than as like a floor, then we might be caught with our pants down. Uh, beyond that, I would argue that Portland should want to exceed these projections uh, for reasons of sustainability, economic prosperity, and just straight up maximizing our tax base. Uh, Portland should be positioning itself to capture an outsized proportion of the region's growth. Um, we should be doing everything we can to attract people to Portland rather than suburbs like Happy Valley, right? Um, and part of that is maximizing our buildable capacity here in Portland, especially within our high opportunity zones close into the central city. Uh, so please treat the numbers from Metro as a floor, not a target. Raise the ceiling up as much as we can where in our most desirable neighborhoods, because um, it gives us wiggle room. All right, thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Okay. I believe we are now transitioning to online testimony. Lisa Maddox, Jennifer Such, and then Joe Costello. Okay, so proceeding to Jennifer Such and then Joe Costello. Sorry, did you say I was first or? Yes, Jennifer. Okay. Welcome. <laughs> Thank you. You turn my camera on. Um, hello, my name is Jennifer Shook. I'm an ooh, my video didn't work. I'm a Northeast Portland resident and a member of Portland Neighbors Welcome. I appreciate the work that BPS has done on the housing needs analysis, and my testimony today is about where we go from here, given the HNA's findings. Housing policy is personal to me. I live in half a duplex, which I was only able to afford with help from my family. And even then, housing prices caused me to move from an extremely walkable neighborhood in Northwest to a more auto-centered one in Northeast. I advocate for housing abundance because I don't think Portland should only be home to people like me 
who benefit from privilege and generational wealth. The bottom line takeaway from the HNA is that Portland does have the capacity for accommodating needed new housing units over the next couple of decades. However, that is not the only or even the most important question we should be asking. As we move forward into the housing production strategy, we must keep in mind that where new housing is located matters. From an equity standpoint, from an environmental resilience and sustainability standpoint, from a housing affordability standpoint, and from an anti-displacement standpoint. We need to make sure that there are enough opportunities for market rate and affordable housing developers to build new units in a dense urban pattern in neighborhoods with proximity to jobs, amenities, and transit, not only along corridors where the impacts of traffic congestion and pollution are highest, but throughout entire neighborhoods. There are high opportunity areas in Portland, most notably the Inner East Side, where current zoning is keeping us from meeting our stated environmental and equity goals and where the density allowed by the residential infill project is insufficient. I hope that the commission and BPS can keep these important nuances in mind throughout the process of establishing land use strategies that will determine the urban pattern of our city for decades to come. Those of us representing Portland Neighbors Welcome look forward to engaging with the commission and BPS throughout the development of the housing production strategy. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony, Jennifer. Joe, you are up next. And just as a heads up for the following, we will have Ted Lavi, Doug Klotz, and Tim McCormick. Welcome, Joe. Um, hi, I'm in, uh, <clears throat> I'm in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And my uh, wife and I are planning uh, a move to Portland and it was in the context of looking at homes in Portland that I came across the information on this meeting. And I don't have a, a statement as much as I have a question or a couple of questions. Um, as space that's identified in the BLI is built out, uh, I'm curious as a prospective homeowner there, what impact that is expected to have on prices of existing housing. And, and then secondly, where will the buyers come from uh, to occupy these homes as the BLI is built out? Will they be people from Portland moving around within the city? Will they be people elsewhere in Oregon moving into the city, indicating that the state is becoming more uh, urbanized? Or will they be coming from outside of Portland? I mentioned these things because there are things that uh, we're thinking about as soon to be residents of Portland. And um, perhaps somehow I could find from all of you guidance on how to answer these questions as we make our plans. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. When we have BPS staff come back and if you're able to stay, we'll ask them to respond to those questions. So we will proceed with testimony but staff will come back up and um, address those questions. That'd be great, thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Up next, we have Ted Labby. Good evening, uh, planning commissioners. Uh, my name is Ted Labby uh, and I live here in Portland in the Kearns neighborhood. Um, there's, I'm, I'm here tonight to support the good work done with the housing needs analysis and there's a lot of well-deserved attention on a housing crisis. Um, and this work uh, shines a light on trends and talks about um, possible remedies. I, I support, I'm here tonight to support the Portland Neighbors Welcome Call for four floors and corner stores from 12th to 60th. I think that's a powerful idea that should be explored. But I also wanna talk tonight about another challenge that we're having as a city, as a state, as a country, Looming behind this housing crisis is a childcare crisis. In March of 2023, the Oregon Values and Beliefs Center released a study that found half of Oregon employers say that challenges around access to childcare impacts their ability to hire and retain employees. Six in 10 with children six years of age or younger who spend on childcare commit an average of 20% of their income on childcare. And six in 10 Oregonians say governments should step up efforts to address the child care crisis. It's growing increasingly difficult for young families to find affordable, 
an accessible quality child childcare in Oregon and across the nation. I know we're here talking about housing, but I want to point to how I want to talk about a little bit about housing for childcare is made more difficult by city of Portland policies, um, specifically the zoning code. Why is this relevant? Schools and early childhood care facilities um, need to house their facilities. And at times, the city's cumbersome and outdated zoning practices have made it difficult for child care providers to find and retain homes. In 2021, Portland's largest preschool was evicted from their St. Stephen's Church home over parking issues. One neighbor's complaint, one neighbor's complaint led to the displacement of 250 families who lost their child care. Similarly, DPAVE, who I work for, uh, who in, installs pocket green spaces at churches and community centers to serve many of these child care facilities, is facing a conditional use review at another church in North Portland over just the same parking issues. I think it's important that you understand not just about the general residential housing needs, but also about the housing needs of child care providers who frequently struggle to find affordable facilities. We have an opportunity coming up with a housing regulatory relief initiative to address some of these challenges, and I hope we can get a chance to address them. Thank you. Thank you, Ted, for your testimony. Welcome, Doug Klotz. Hi, um, Chair O'Meara and Commissioners. My name is Doug Klotz. I live in Southeast Portland. I'm glad to see the HNA process moving forward. Uh, Portland HNA shows a surplus of capacity, but it does not say how, how to grow to meet uh, city and state goals. Um, more affordable housing is one of these goals. Uh, as you probably know, the report paints a pretty disturbing picture of this with Black households unable to afford to buy or even rent in Portland, and Latin households also faring poorly, as Ariel has noted. Um, although the coming upcoming HPS is a zoning project, increasing the number of units per lot over a large enough area often lowers the price per unit. Uh, in some parts of the city, there is good transit, tra access to jobs and stores and parks within walking distance. And these high opportunity areas should be zoned to allow many more households to, to live there. Yet miles of these areas are now zoned low density residential, what used to be called single family, limiting access for many. Um, the city should take advantage of the high opportunity areas in, in areas where displacement is not likely and upzone those areas, allowing more multifamily housing so more people can live there. This will mean uh, removing Portland's sad zoning legacy of apartments only on busy streets with only single family house, homes allowed elsewhere. This um, arguably racist 1959 zoning pattern should be changed and mapped to, um, where am I? <laughs> as higher density zoning uh, for multi-unit and mixed use buildings, as you've heard other testifiers uh, mentioned. Um, uh, the RIP is helpful in that, uh, um, in that way, but it is not yielding enough housing to do that, to uh, really solve the problem. This new, more equitable pattern of, of uh, multifamily stretching from one arterial to the other um, is needed to, to allow people to live uh, not just on arterials, but uh, several blocks away from arterials so, you know, and, and still have the advantage of all the uh, transportation there. Um, mapping mixed use and multifamily more broadly also means folks are less likely to drive for everyday needs as bus, bike, and walking are reasonable options and will help reduce our largest source of greenhouse gases, which is transportation emissions. It's like 40 or 45 percent of our emissions in, in the region. Um, mapping the, uh, yes, fully fully funded inclusionary zoning is all, must also be a part of this. The current inclusionary zoning um, practice doesn't not, not really work very well. It's, it's in, in, no, arguably uh, damping down uh, production of housing. I look forward to the housing production strategy and mapping out a city of complete neighborhoods that perform much better than the ones that are currently labeled complete neighborhoods. And so the more people can take advantage of what Portland has to offer. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony, Doug. Up next, we have Tim McCormick. And after Tim, we'll have Jonathan Greenwood, Zachary Lesher, and Jordan Lewis.
Hi, can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Hi, sorry. Uh, good evening, Chair, Commissioners, and Chief Planner, Planner Diefendorfer. My name is Tim McCormick of Housing Alternatives Network, and um, I am going to sort of speak a, a bit off the cuff. I didn't, as I didn't prepare for this in advance. Um, I come to this from the perspective of someone long living at extremely low income and also like building and creating and living in informal housing. And I've closely followed the um, or ONA process and looking at how it's filtering down. Now, from my perspective, I, I'm going to, you know, suggest some, some major challenges here uh, to it. One of them is that the basic framework of this, which seems sensible enough, says we should build what's needed. And it says, well, uh, you know, there's there's this many projected households that would be needing housing, and therefore we must, you know, build housing to that. I just like to point out that that is in itself more or less fundamentally a fallacy, because in the United States, only a very tiny fraction of housing occupied by lower income people was actually built for them. And one way you can see how this is fallacious is that I or anyone else looking for housing generally have little to no interest in what is was just built or is currently being built my interest is in what is available and that's deeply driven by the total stock of housing being built so from my perspective i'd be happy to have an explosion of speculative building at the high end and have it all go bankrupt and being offered for sale cheap that would free up all the housing that i might be able to afford and um then i'd like to say um you know when i when i look at the landscape of things considered it's fairly clear to me that there's there's very little under consideration that is likely in any way to serve my needs or provide me housing. Uh, because <clears throat> we're talking about um, uh, supporting and policy to support, you know, costly apartment buildings with long queues of people to get into them. Well, what I need is literally days from now, like a place of land to move to or any place I could park a vehicle. And I would submit that what we need moving forward is much more perspective brought in from the people actually on the lower rungs of housing and particularly close to homelessness and ways that we might serve them directly, for instance, with rent support or income assistance. I would say that the typical apartment that the affordable industry produces, I would be better helped and would sooner choose 5% of the cost of it given to me as income or rent support than the apartment that they would put me into. Because I want, like you, the option to live where I choose to live and to live within my means. What I don't want is to have my living options or the ones that your policies support restrict me to a tiny number of currently available units, which I must qualify through through ex an extensive process of documenting my income and qualifying and be judged by other people. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Next, we have Jonathan Greenwood. Welcome, Jonathan. Hello. Uh, hello. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Go ahead, Jonathan. I'm sorry. Hello, Planning Commission. My name is Jonathan Greenwood. The vision for Portland's close-in neighborhood centered on constructing four-floor buildings with corner stores is a brilliant and forward-looking proposal that deserves wholehearted support. It aligns with the principles of creating vibrant, accessible, and diverse urban communities. The idea of allowing street-scale apartment buildings on residential lots within the 12th to 60th Fremont to Powell area is a fantastic way to promote mixed income and mixed use neighborhoods. The call to address racial inequities and pr promote fair housing is not just essential, it's a moral imperative. The housing needs analysis underscores the glaring disparities 
where no neighborhood is currently affordable for black households and access is limited for Latina and Native American households. It's crucial for the commission to consider the geographical distribution of zone capacity for new homes and make adjustments to ensure that housing opportunities are distributed fairly with minimal, with minimal displacement risk, job access, and sustainable transit options. Moreover, supporting a minimum housing density of four stories is a wise decision. Adequate density is key to addressing Portland's housing shortage effectively while maintaining the character and accessibility of these neighborhoods. This initiative, driven by the community's aspirations for a more inclusive and equitable city, is a testament to the collective vision for Portland's future. By focusing on a walkable, transit-rich, and mixed-use neighborhoods, we can create spaces that cater to the needs of all residents and enhance the city's overall quality of life. In conclusion, this vision embodies the spirit of progress, equity, and responsible urban development. It is a step towards ensuring that Portland remains a place where everyone, regardless of their background, can find a home and thrive. This proposal deserves widespread support and a commitment to making it a reality. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan, for your testimony. Up next, we have Zachary Lesher, and after Zachary, we will have Jordan Lewis and Matt Tuckerman. Welcome, Zachary. Hi, thank you. Uh, my name is Zachary Lesher. Thank you to the commissioners and uh, chair for the opportunity to comment. Um, I live in a relatively affluent, close in neighborhood where I have easy access to employment uh, and opportunities and services within walking, biking, and transit range. Uh, not coincidentally, I live in an apartment along a dangerous arterial. Um, that's because most of the zone capacity in my neighborhood, or one is likely to find an available unit, is uh, narrowly clustered in these areas. Uh, in short, I live in a part of the city where there is a high opportunity score, a low risk of displacement, and where much of the land is zoned uh, for low density development. As previous commenters have said, please consider the geographic distribution of zone capacity and consider adding capacity in areas where high, with a high opportunity score and low risk of displacement um, in order to allow these places to be within reach of uh, more, a more diverse uh, set of households. Um, it's on this basis that I would like to join the call for four floors and corner stores in the inner east side. Thank you very much. Thank you for your testimony. Up next, we have Jordan Lewis. Okay, we will be proceeding to Matt Tuckerman. Welcome, Matt. Good evening, Planning Commission. Uh, thanks so much for having me here. My name is Matt Tuckerbaum. I'm a homeowner in inner Southeast Portland and a member of Portland Neighbors Welcome. Um, I'm extremely fortunate to be able to live in an amenity rich part of Southeast Portland. Um, and as a member of Portland Neighbors Welcome, I advocate for housing abundance because housing abundance results in affordability. And when housing is affordable, it can be a foundation that allows people to build stable and fulfilling lives in the vast majority of circumstances. Like many others here tonight, I support the idea of zoning for four floors and co corner stores throughout the Inner East Side. I appreciate the work that BPS has done to collect this valuable data for the housing needs analysis. And my testimony today is primarily feedback on the zoning capacity framing. The current frame for this HNA is that Portland already has the capacity for accommodating needed new housing units over the next decade or so. However, I have a few fundal, fundamental questions about this framing um, that I wanna ask. My core assumption that I bring to this is that Portland is in the midst of a housing crisis, something I think that most of us can agree on. Housing, housing costs have arisen so dramatically here over the last decade plus that affordability is a problem for the vast majority of people and far too many of our neighbors don't have a home at all. With that in mind, I ask, if Portland currently has the zone capacity to address the need for years in the future, why do we still have the current crisis? I know as many as many people do that there are, and recognize that there are many other factors at play, including financing, permitting, et cetera. But I still question whether our assumptions about sufficient capacity are correct. Do we actually need significantly more capacity in order to meet the dire needs from our current crisis? Additionally, echoing the point that Bradley uh, raised earlier, we we are taking certain trends for granted. For example, that the city is getting older, households are getting smaller, et cetera. 
But I would argue that those trends are the result of insufficient housing production where homeowners that purchased their homes long ago are able to stay in large homes and high amenity places while they age, while families are pushed in, pushed out to the suburbs. We need to have more agency and recognize that Portland is and will be a desirable place to live for people who want to live in a socially accepting uh, environment and a place that's somewhat ins insulated from the worst effects of climate change as opposed to places in the Sun Belt. Our zoning should be proactive. It should set us up to be a city made of neighborhoods that for people of all ages, stages, and wages. We should not let the data based on trends that we baked in years ago to dictate our plans for the future. The HNA is an opportunity for us to think critically about what we need to build for the housing that will address the housing crisis that we have today, and for hopefully the many people that will want to join us here in Portland in the future, whether that's growing our own families that are already here or accepting people that want to be a part of Portland and Oregon. I hope that the commission and BPS can take these points into account in the final draft of the HNA and as we move forward into the housing production strategy. Those of us representing Portland Neighbors Welcome look forward to contributing our vision for a city filled with abundant housing that can accommodate the needs of everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Matt, for your testimony. Julie, I believe that's it for signed up testimony, but as previously mentioned, we will be continuing testimony through the October 10th meeting. Um, I'll invite BPS staff up um, again to address questions. I know we had questions from Joe Costello. A couple more were just posed. Invite staff to address those if you're able tonight, and then we'll open up uh, questions and comments from commission members. Yeah, good evening. Um, Tom Armstrong from BPS. I think um, just starting with with uh, Joe Costello, Mr. Costello's questions about how does how does all of this work sort of impact what's the impact on the existing housing and, and maybe on on sort of housing prices? Um, I think there, you know, it is tricky. I think when we look at at especially detached single family homes in Portland, we're not going to build a lot more of those. So there's a there's a pretty finite supply of of that type of housing. Um, I think the the buildable land inventory shows that you know 90% of our capacity is in more of the multi dwelling apartment townhouse um, housing types. So that's where we're going to be able to add um, additional housing opportunities. So I think, you know, if depending on the type of housing you're looking at, um, those sing single family detached homes with a yard um, that you that you find across Portland are are sort of that's what we have um, here today. We don't have, you know, the the expansion areas for those in the region are on the edges and in the suburbs. Um, what I think what you hear in the other testimony and, and what we would hope is that by producing more housing, um, yes, the new housing and new construction is more expensive, but as we add more units, especially as we keep up with population growth, um, that 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 helps keep um, sort of a lid on and, a, and a, has a moderating influence on rents, um, and and where where at the same time, hopefully on our economic side, we're increasing incomes, and that 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 rent cost housing cost burden um, can can lessen, um, uh, unlike what we see in in other communities in in say in California. Um, what was the other question there? Um, so from uh, Matt. Yeah, Turbon. so I think, um, you know, the, the, the idea or, or the analysis that we've had a lot of uh, 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 an excess capacity of zoned capacity, has, that's been that way um, for many years. Um, and I think what we've said here and what what we've heard in the testimony 
Um, and what we mean by being strategic is that even, you know, we have not turned our back on the capacity issue and the, the, the making sure we have room to grow. Um, you know, we had basically this much capacity in 2015, 2016. Um, and since then, we've rewritten the mixed use zones, the multi dwelling zones, the residential infill zones, all which resulted in sort of an increase in allowable densities. Um, meanwhile, we continue to sort of, and what you'll hear later tonight, to, to work sort of the development standards um, side of the issue. I think what we've seen, um, you know, in the last four or five years is a more focus on sort of the permitting and what it takes to get development, what it takes to build these houses and, and, and what can the city do to um, reduce that cost of development so we see more development and we activate that capacity that's available. Um, but I think in the testimony that you hear tonight, um, you know, I don't think it's one where, hey, we've got plenty, we'll, we'll go away. I think we have a different, different issue. And again, this is sort of set up with the way the state law is set up. We have a different, you know, the state law was really written for basically all the other cities outside the metro region that go through this process and they wind up usually with an urban growth boundary expansion. Um, especially in Portland, we have a different set of challenges and that's where the product production strategy takes over is how do we activate more of that um, capacity that we do have? And, and as the testimony talked about, how do we create those opportunities in those high opportunity areas across the city and keep looking at our zoning map and our zoning code to enable that? Thank you, Tom. We also heard a lot from testifiers tonight about the four floors with the corner store concept. Um, I am assuming that is referring to the four-story walk-ups that are not permitted or allowed per code, but I'm just wondering if there's any more context in terms of the um, sort of where does that fit? Where does that concept fit within the housing needs analysis? Yeah, I, I think what that's reflecting on that and and we can bring a few maps back on October 10th is especially with residential infill and where we started to see the development is not in the inner neighborhoods and that's a function of price um, the 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 single family homes in those inner neighborhoods are just too expensive to be able to buy tear down and put in four townhouses we're seeing we're seeing that development take place on sort of a middle ring um, outside of that core area. So how do you unlock more capacity in those inner neighborhoods that are closer to the jobs in the central city that are well served by transit and our bike system? And one way to do that is to increase the density, expand our corridors, look at the areas between the, 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 the major corridors where we find our higher density mixed use and, and how, what is that threshold of density that begins to make it, as Sam was talking about, the, the residual land value um, where a developer can afford to pay five, six, seven hundred thousand dollars for a house and be able to build 20 units or, or whatever. Commissioners, uh, good afternoon. Patricia Diefendefer. I just wanted to. Um, contribute a few overarching um, sort of points based on the testimony that we heard. I think one thing that I wanted to make sure is very clear, as we've been saying, is this is this is the numbers, right? So this is the housing needs analysis that gives us um, the numbers and the kind of state of affairs, what it is that we're dealing with. The next phase of this work is where we will talk about the strategies. The housing production strategy will, uh, will allow us an opportunity to talk about what are the things that we need to do to not only generate or facilitate the production of housing, but to facilitate the production of housing at all the for the, all the different um, household types, you know, and needs, and income levels? So the responding to the the fact that we have a growing number of um, households with uh, elderly uh, individuals, with people with disabilities, all of the different. 
excuse me, the income levels that we need to accommodate. So that's where the housing production strategy is where we will be able to get into what are the different approaches to, to address all those different housing needs. The other thing that I wanted to point out, um, I think is particularly important, there was some um, testimony about the, the metro target um, and that being, you know, that being kind of our, high, our upper end of what we're, what we're accommodating. And in fact, I'm sure you recall from that one slide, and we can bring it back up if we need to, we actually used a methodology wherein we accounted for a lot of other units um, above and beyond that, that metro um, allocation that was given to us, right? So we, uh, based on that analysis, we went from 97,000 units thereabouts to over 120,000 units. That's, that is not treating the metro number as like our, our upper limit, but rather using that as our s sort of base and then building from there to building in all the, un the historic underproduction and all the things that were described that was part of the methodology. So, um, and, you know, I think there's, I have had experience with um, this kind of effort in my, in my other cities, and I can say that, you know, zoning capacity is only, how much zoning capacity you have is only one factor. It's very important to have sufficient zoning capacity. Um, the question I think for us is we, you know, our analysis shows we have zoning capacity. The question, um, which is a valid question that I'm sure we'll talk about through the housing production strategy phase of the work is what kind of units, you know, can be accommodated in those areas and um, where, where are those units? Like, so we can, we can talk about should, should we create more capacity in other areas? That's a, that's a, a valid uh, conversation to have, but it, it doesn't change the fact that we do have, you know, the zoning capacity to accommodate and that exceeds the, the need that we have, whether they're in the right places or, you know, what kind of housing typologies might result um, in those, those places, that, that is something that I think we can discuss, you know, through this process. So uh, in the next phase, uh, really, of the work. I just wanted to m outline some of those points. Thank you, Patricia. Um, I'll open it up for commissioner questions and comments. I do have one of my own. Um, just uh, quickly, Ariel, in your um, calculation, there was an 800, uh, roughly 800 ad for vacation um, homes. I'm wondering, does that include short-term rentals such as Airbnb or those excluded? 800 just seemed pretty low. Um, I understand maybe Portland isn't the top vacation destination for second homes, but just curious about that count and whether it included um, the sec the Airbnb uh, type of uh, rentals in that calculation. See you. There you go. Okay, uh, that's a great question. So the ONA methodology that the state has recommended utilizes um, ACS or census data, and so it comes from applying that ratio of our current vacation homes, which the ACS accounts for, which in theory should include the short-term rentals, um, to our current overall units, which is about 0.77%, so less than 1% of our total units. Um, I did, it because that's a great question, and I had the same question um, we all did about whether or not that was sufficient to even account for those short-term rentals. We have challenges with data collection, um, and but with the short-term rental registry that we have, that number is pretty closely aligned with that short-term rental registry number. Um, I don't remember the exact amount, but while it seems low with the data that we have, that is a, a rough estimate. So. Okay, thank you. Questions or comments from other commissioners? Commissioner Patel, for the record, I had, uh, first of all, uh, thank you for everyone for uh, physically being here and being online and for everyone who had submitted their testimony. It's good to see this level of engagement early on as we address these critical issues um, regarding housing. Um, I had a question for staff. Um, uh, for the HPS, um, I remember seeing a slide addressing offer uh, incentives, and I know as part of the HPS, there's going to be uh, policies, programs 
including many incentives to address uh, housing feasibility uh, to meet the, the capacity goals. And one of them that's garnered a lot of attention from the development community and many is the IH program. Is the IH program part of, will be part of the uh, HPS as uh, something to be analyzed, um, its benefits in reaching capacity goals, its barriers and challenges, and so forth. Um, yes, and and actually, the the Housing Bureau, with with our cooperation, um, is just wrapping up a study. They did a, a what what's called a ca calibration study um, that really looks at the cost of development com and the cost of compliance with the inclusionary housing program. Um, with the the incentive package that um, the city offers, uh, I, you know the high level takeaway from that is that um, it all comes down to the tax abatement, um, the property tax abatement that we offer, uh, and we offer a, a a full tax abatement on the all of the units on projects inside the central city, and that is enough to offset the cost of compliance with inclusionary housing. Unfortunately, today, it, it, there are other challenges with developing um, uh, housing in terms of construction costs and interest rates versus achievable rents that are sort of beyond the burden of that program. Outside of the central city, it's a different story because um, our uh, program our our agreement with Multnomah County is to um, cap the amount of tax abatement that we offer, and that and so outside the central city, it's limited to just the affordable units. And I think what this study shows is that if we were able to um, offer a full tax abatement on the whole building, that that is enough to. Um, offset the cost of compliance with inclusionary housing and would, would help narrow that feasibility gap for projects outside the central city. We, we expect that um, report to be published anytime now, and we can provide that um, to you. And um, if we wanted, you know, in one of these upcoming meetings, if we have time, we can dig deeper into those findings for you. Um, uh, yeah, I think that would be great if... Uh, would other commissioners be interested? Yep. Thank you. And that was the calibration study? Yes. Thanks. Great. I see Vice Chair Thompson, and then we'll go to Commissioner Spivak. Go ahead. Yeah. Well, thank you, Sam and Ariel and Tom, for the presentation and for all of the testifiers for, for coming tonight. Um, I'll just start out with a general comment, and maybe this can be something that we can discuss a little bit more um, at our next work session. Um, but I guess um, what I'm really still struggling with, with the housing needs analysis, is the connection between unit supply and new unit production and the affordability crisis. Like when I look at the numbers that I'm seeing in the analysis, Aside, setting aside the affordability issue, which it makes very clear is a huge problem, especially for BIPOC households. Um, it doesn't seem like I, that there's a clear explanation or rationale for the crisis that I think many of us agree that we have, you know, like 120,000 units, even with the units that we've added and the need for increased vacancy by 2045. Okay, then we divide that by however many years there are between now and then. It's like 5,000 or 6,000 units a year, which is basically tracking with what we've been doing, but like what we're doing isn't working. Um, we're, we're talking also tonight about the um, housing regulatory relief package, which I think is getting at this issue of like the 5,000 is not enough or like the production is not happening that we need, but I just didn't really feel like that story or explanation came through um, for me in the analysis. And I think that um, some of it was a little bit tied to vacancy rate. I mean, I think that that maybe making that a little bit clearer or more prominent might help 
Um, I found it really interesting, like the different tables on vacancy rates and looking at how low they are for certain typologies like single family and smaller apartments. And then they're relatively higher for the 50 plus buildings. So like what lessons can we learn from that? And then there were multiple allusions to a healthy vacancy rate, but I don't know if that was ever defined. So it's like our vacancy rates are low, I think, like is five to 7% low? And if so, what do we, what are we actually targeting? Where, where do we need to be? So I'll leave that comment there. Um, the question that I have, um, and again, if there's not time to get into this now, that's totally fine. We can talk about it at the next meeting, but on the buildable lands inventory, um, I was just curious to better understand how much um, redevelopment comprises the, the total availability of the 230,000 or whatever units, because when we looked at um, the capacity per neighborhood, the most capacity exists in the central city, which implies that like quite a lot of that development capacity is in redevelopment. And so then I just start to have questions about um, how aligned the feasibility and the economics are aligned to actual real world conditions currently today in 2023, and then how much they um, can account for the volatility of things that are, are really difficult, you know, I mean, price escalation and the things that can really make or break construction month to month or year to year are really hard to capture. And so I feel like that's a little bit fuzzy or a bit of a var variable that I would like to better understand. Thank you. Yeah, um, there's a lot there. I, I think just starting with, you know, what we're doing is not working. I think there is, there has been a re realization that, that that is the case. I mean, you know, we have been tracking pretty close to Metro's growth forecast, growth allocation for Portland, and yet we still have an affordability problem. And I think you've seen that in the changes with the state legislation, like we are planning for more. The state is sort of pushing cities to plan for more. Um, and and yet you see in the state format um, that it's not just about the zoning and zoning capacity. That's where the production strategy really gets into. Well, are you are you actually building those units? And if those units aren't happening, what more can cities do to make them happen? And so I think um, you know we're it, it it is more than the zoning capacity. And so that's what why we're taking a closer look at permitting and SDC payment timing and um, all of those other factors that go into producing a unit of housing. Um, so I think there's a lot there to un un untangle. Um, you know, we can bring back a little bit more look closer look at the vacancy rates. And, you know, part of that also is, you know, we're at the mercy of private investment. Um, in Portland, um, you know, 90% of our development is private investors taking the risk to build housing in Portland. It's, it's a pretty good return, um, but, you know, it is, you know, we are, we are dependent on that, on people willing to take that risk and, and invest those monies. Um, Sam, do you, do you have a sense of the redevelopment share? But we can bring that back. I yeah, we can definitely bring that back. Um, that's easy to pass out. Um, I don't I don't want to commit anything to the record that would be uh, untrue. Um, but I, I will say, in terms of you know, to your question about um, accounting for market volatility on the redevelopment side, um, you know, we we've got these 16 or 17, I think 17 different housing prototypes and they, they factor in anything from, you know, construction costs to interest rates to uh, rent and sale prices and everything in between. Um, and we have, um, you know, we, we recognize that we're in a very challenging environment for uh, market rate development right now uh, because of, you know, many of those cost related, um, cost related things. Uh, but in our model, we've, we've tried to account 
you know, best we can. It's really hard to project those things like interest rates, um, but try to account for some of that volatility um, looking forward. So I think um, you know, we, ha we, we haven't heard from too many folks that, you know, what we're, the, the assumptions that we've made are off base or anything like that. Um, and so, you know, we've, we've done the best we can to kind of project a somewhat stabilized um uh market um the same thing kind of goes for the vacancy you know what is a healthy vacancy um on the rental market in the apartment uh, rental apartment market we tend to think of five percent as kind of market equilibrium anything beyond that may well in theory sees some kind of rental rate relief um on the consumer side on the ownership side, it tends to be a little bit higher. Single dwellings own. Um, single dwellings tend to be, you know, uh, and, and and duplexes um, uh, and the middle housing actually tends to be a little lower. Sorry, um, just because of the sheer kind of quantity of those relative to the uh, the rental apartments. Um, but yeah, no, I think on the on the redevelopment versus vacant uh, piece, um, you. are I, I would sus I suspect that um, or I'd, I I would um, I suspect the market in uh, the market based answer would be that a lot of our capacity is in our re in is in redevelopment. Uh, the one thing that I will add, the one caveat to that is um, that the state requires us to consider all kind of vacant land as buildable. We reduce that overall capacity if it's really constrained, but, you know, we, we have to take all vacant land regardless of, um, of, you know, how much it costs essentially. So that's one caveat to that. Thank you. Um, Commissioner Spear, I, I keep looking at this clock and I realize it's not moving. <laughs> so we can be on this topic forever. <laughs> so sorry about that. Um, I've got, um, I guess three thoughts going from small, medium, large. The small one is, um, Tiny Homes on Wheels. Um, that was legalized through the Shelter to Housing Project. Um, and in my neighborhood in Cole, I know it's been informally surveyed. There are about as many of those as there are accessory dwelling units. ADUs we can count because they get permitted. Tiny Homes on Wheels, we don't know how many there are. Um, it's becoming a big enough thing that it would be nice to have data on that somehow. Um, we do track mobile homes, boats, you know, there's like other kinds of things we track. It'd be nice to be able to get information on that. Um, medium size, um, so I was, pretty thrilled when we saw the uptake from the residential info project thing but i had a different I, I think that the story that's getting attention is the zoning side getting permission to build this stuff but i think a big part of the story is customer demand and demographics um because if we remember before rip we were seeing lots of 800 square foot adus and in larger buildings the sweet spot is like studios and one bedroom apartments small units and you're getting single family homes 2,000 feet 2,500 and larger. Nobody was building almost anything in the 1,000 to 1,500 square foot range. Now we're seeing lots of homes in that smaller, moderate house size range. I think there's been pent up demand for that. So I don't know if this gets addressed in a study, but I think that um, those homes, we know we have lots of two and three person households in the city. And those households are either being crammed in small spaces or over consuming in housing. So this provides an option to not do that. So I think somehow that's part of the housing needs assessment is demographic match to housing. Um, and the third thing, big picture, um, Sam, you shared that in three years there's going to be a check-in project on this. Um, people who know me know I'm, I'm, I'm an impatient guy, um, and what goes through my head is, that, okay, if we do this now, and then we take a year to do the um, housing performance strategy, and then we do start doing implementation, we'll get to three years and we haven't done anything. So I guess I'm just confirming that I would I'd like to think that this housing perform production strategy can include zoning changes that it could be a zoning project also, much like we've done with Southeast Rising, Southwest Corner Plan, where there's a zoning package that also includes strategies to take it further. So I'm not sure what the planning is on this project, but we heard a lot of testimony with other people who are probably impatient like I am um, to see some, but I think we're only gonna see changes if we actually change the code or the map or both. So I guess I'm doing a little nudge if I can to say it would be great for that HPS to include changes to the rules of the game. Thanks. Commissioner Routh? 
Um, hello, everyone. Uh, Commissioner Rouse, for the record, I join you from Drizzly, D.C. and the uh, U.S. Green Building Council's and uh, Green Build Conference. Uh, I echo what Commissioner Spivak just said. Um, I, I would be, I would be, I, I, I crave seeing, you know, how do we, what can zoning change look like? We did hear a lot of testimony from that this evening. And a few other, I know that we have seen the uh, the maps of uh, Black and Latin households, uh, what can be afforded. Um, so I, I know that that's not the first time we have seen this. And also I want to, like our work is not done until those maps substantively change. And that that it it remains a shock. I know that zoning is primarily what our tool kit comprises in this space, but um, as Portlanders, as residents, as advocates in other spaces, uh, recognizing the other aspects of how we build shared prosperity, um, access to housing is one of them. Um, housing uh, typologies. Uh, are one, um, but also you know things like monthly child payments, making those uh, uh, um, those permanent. Um, uh, working what we can do for to ensure that everything that we build in the city is at a living or thriving wage uh, is another. And uh, I'm I'm curious. Uh, you know, we talked a little bit about short-term rentals. I believe there was an audit update a couple of years ago about a small uh, short-term rental uh, enforcement and compliance. Um, I would be interested to see. Uh, but there was a question about what those data tools look like. So I'd be curious um, to hear. You know, what what are the updates? How can we get some of that? You know. Uh, are we building data tools so that we can answer those questions about what what is available and and what what also needs to be enforced? Um, so that's another. And I just want to I want to appreciate Ted Labby uh, bringing up the child care access piece. Uh, I worked for a short time in Rep uh, Rep Car and Powers office, and uh, we saw a lot of issues around. Um, child care providers who were renting um, their space that provided child care and, and how precarious that is. So I, I want to echo uh, and lift up what, what Ted Labby said and how that relates to um, what families, uh, particularly of younger, with younger children can afford and uh, have as possibilities in the city. So um, echoing Commissioner Spivak, and uh, and yes, thank you. Thank you. Go ahead, uh, Vice Chair Pouncil. Uh, yes. Um, can you hear me? Okay. Yes, we can. Okay. Great. All right. Um, uh, first of all, uh, thank you so much uh, for um, for uh, uh, the presentation tonight. Um, and uh, I am. Uh, Really uh, grateful to hear all of the testimony tonight. Uh, it's uh, fantastic to see uh, community come out and and uh, share their thoughts. Um, uh, some of the things that I wanted to just kind of share that came out through the testimony that I was hearing, um, you know, of course, was you know advocating for for housing abundance um, and um, allowing for street scale housing in residential areas. Um, a couple of things that really stuck with me through the testimony this evening was, um, and, I, and I, I think that this should be something that uh, should be placed in the uh, housing needs analysis, and that is talking to people who are close to houselessness and what needs to be, what, what, what it was that they need and help need and, and how this could possibly help uh, the housing need analysis to, you know, come up with some some decisions on, you know, how to move forward. Um, you know, this could possibly be done through, you know, finding these individuals through grants that people have already received, you know, for housing assistance or reaching out to uh, civic life, you know, for people who may be reaching out to those uh, 
uh, agencies to um, seek out uh, housing um, assistance. But I think that's a really important one. And then um, one thing, one of the uh, comments that was shared in testimony tonight was a uh, uh, down payment grant and, and uh, for for helping um, Portlanders to possibly buy their first home. Um, I am a recipient of this from the city that I grew up in. Um, I received a, a grant to help me purchase my first home in my city and it was uh, an amazing opportunity that has uh, really brought me into um, housing stability and I, I think that you know having this as a possibility for uh, for young Portlanders particularly um, and you know it's, it's a really valuable tool and I and I can't help but echoing that yeah it, it's important that we you know, have um, that we make sure that, that you know young people have um, stability in the city to grow families and uh, to create that wealth. So um, that we all kind of you know crave and would like to have to have a prosperous Portland. Um, yeah, I just wanted to share some of those things. Um, uh, I think everyone is. I think this is going in a great in a great direction. I, I'm excited to hear more about it and how we could. I'll move forward on it and um, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Alexander, go ahead. Thank you, I, I wanna join my fellow commissioners in thanking staff for the presentation, the data, and also the public testimony, not, not just the testimony this evening, but the posted testimony as well, which you all had an opportunity to review. It's been very enlightening for me personally. Um, my, my my comment would be that this analysis would be very helpful to me if I had the opportunity to not only look at the shifting demographics which are identified in terms of BIPOC households, elders, two and three family, but I'd like to also get a sense of how that differed from the projections that were given in 2009. It's one thing to note it the trending. It's another thing to know how precise we were in that historical and projective analysis because I think there's some learning there. Um, if you look at displaced populations, those people may be the same, but 15 years ago, people were put in a position where one generational wealth was obliterated because they were not able to move that information forward. And secondly, they traded a community for an address. And that goes to one of the comments that was offered today where the focus was on homes, not households. And if we can begin to just begin to frame that type of thinking, it would be very helpful for me to sort of understand the greater and lesser of equals as we begin to look at this data. So again, I commend you. I think this is a great analytical framework, but I hope that the lessons of the last several years where we could not have projected that our world would be buried would be where it is, have given us a filter that we can bring to this looking forward. Thank you. Okay, I would also like to chime in with, um, on the housing production strategy and the outreach. Um, I would like the opportunity for the commission to review that strategy and, and bring forward recommendations. I have ideas about affordable housing networks, tenant council, for example, at my organization. Um, I think we've heard those comments throughout tonight around how do we really engage uh, both the organizations that are building affordable housing, but also tenants and those that are housing insecure um, when we start looking at the housing production strategy. Um, and so wanted to bring that forward um, as an opportunity for the commission and others to inform that when we're at that outreach stage. Um, I think this is wrapping up this portion of the agenda. Thank you all so much. Really echo all of the thanks and gratitude for the testimony tonight. I do want to request a five minute break. Um, so if we could reconvene at, let's call it uh, 6.56. And I will go ahead and um, call us back to order at that time. Thank you all so much.
on the September 26, 2023 City of Portland Planning Commission meeting. And the next portion of our agenda, um, inviting here for presentation, Sandra Wood and <coughs> Phil Namany. And they are going to be providing a briefing on the Housing Regulatory Relief Project. Welcome. And we just have to go there. Right? Um, I'm not sure if you guys are able to see the screen. I am sure. Great. There I am. Great. Good evening, commissioners. My name is Sandra Wood. I'm with the Bureau of Planning and Sustainability. I'm the Code Development Manager. And I'm here with a project manager for the Housing Regulatory Relief Project. His name is Phil Namini. And we're here to present some zoning code amendments um, that we'll be seeking your approval for um, and your recommendation to City Council when we get to that point. But I'm jumping ahead a little bit. We um, just published the proposed draft for this project and um, sent out our public notices last week. And we wanted to come here today to give you ample time to understand what the proposal are, is and well ahead of the hearing, which is um, scheduled for October 24th. So two meetings from now. Um, um, as I described, today is a briefing, not a public hearing. Um, in two meetings on October 24th, we'll hold a public hearing. And then the meeting after that on November 14th is when we'll be seeking the Planning Commission's recommendation and vote on that day. Um, so that's November 14th, and we are hoping to be at City Council in December. Um, they've requested that this um, project be before them um, by the end of the year. So that's what our, um, that's what our um, schedule is. Um, the proposal actually is quite simple, if you look at it this way in this one little sentence. It's to temporarily suspend um, for five years and permanently change several zoning code rules to provide regulatory relief for the building of needed um, housing, for, so for some housing projects. Oh, I put this in the wrong spot. <laughs> there we go. There's our, our timeline. Um, this project is in response to the immediate housing crisis that we have been discussing or you were discussing earlier. Um, there are several sources that we drew from to identify the issues to address in the zoning code. Um, foremost is the housing production survey that was conducted earlier this year by the Bureau of Development Services at the request of Commissioner Rubio. The survey, survey um, sought input from developers and the public on processes and policy related to the development of housing that may merit reconsideration as the city works to increase housing production. We also looked at issues that the Inclusionary Housing Calibration Study Stakeholder Group mentioned um, in their mem memo to Commissioner Rubio this summer. Um, those issues that were mentioned were also included in the preliminary findings from a study that looked at the cost of some of those regulations that was conducted by the um, Bay Area Economics um, Group um, that is um, conducting a study. They had preliminary findings and a, a subsequent report will be coming out. Um, in the meantime, there's also some work that's taken place from um, Governor Kotex um, Housing Production Advisory Committee. There's a lot of conversation there about potential um, changes to rules statewide. We're tracking that and actively um, engaged in those conversations. And of course, the housing needs analysis and the housing production strategy that you just listened um, to a presentation and hearing about um, is something else happening in this arena. Um, we just wanted to share where, you know, all the different conversations that are happening on one slide and where we got the scope for this um, quicker project. Um, so getting back to the survey, we wanted to share a little bit about that because you haven't heard um, in this forum about that. Um, the survey included, uh, so this was the housing production survey that Bureau of Development Services put out in the spring. The survey included about 20 development related and process related requirements. And um, most of them were focused on zoning regulations and it asked the respondents to identify their top five issues that they'd encountered or that they thought was uh, an, um, 
an impediment to housing production. They received 610 responses. Um, and of the top 10 issues identified in the survey, the seven that are identified on, shown on this slide are zoning related. The amendments to the top four topics on this slide um, are included in the proposal that Phil will share with you in just a bit. So we're bicycle parking, ground floor active use and height, parking impact analysis, and bird safe glazing. The bottom three topics are not included in the proposal, and I wanted to share why. Um, the maximum height limits and the floor area ratios, as you know, those are pretty fundamental to our growth strategy um, and to our comp plan policies and to zoning and re require an infrastructure analysis. So we thought it was too much to take on in the you know one and a half months we had to turn this project around. So that's why we didn't include those. Um, the middle housing land divisions was also identified. Um, but when the survey went out, middle housing land divisions were only pos uh, were um, had only been in effect for five months. So we felt it was too early to understand really what the issues were, and maybe it was just taking staff and the public a little time to understand what those implementation issues were and how to work out those kinks. Um, anecdotally, we've heard that those are going more smoothly now, so that's good news. Um, but that's the reason we didn't include them in this project. So with that, I'm going to pass it on to Phil, who will explain the proposal. Good evening. Uh, once again, Phil Namini with uh, Bureau of Planning and Sustainability and Co-Development. Uh, and so this housing regulatory relief project, um, through the review of these uh, different sources and discussions with uh, development services, we identified 16 issues uh, that warranted uh, review and potential amendments on. And you can kind of see all 16 here. Uh, we've sort of grouped them into three categories. Uh, those that uh, kind of fall under development and design standards, so kind of the standards that, that uh, different buildings may have to achieve as they, as they get proposed. Uh, there, there's a smaller subset of uh, ones that are focused on the central city, and then there's some that uh, have more to do with process improvement and, and things like approval criteria and, and, uh, and uh, types of land use processes. So um, unfortunately, this one does not on the on the screen, it does not show the ones that we're shading. I'm not gonna go through all 16 of them, uh, but you may be able to see on your screens, but uh, we are going to focus, you can see it, okay. Um, so <coughs> bicycle parking, the ground floor items, uh, eco roofs, bird safe glazing, uh, neighborhood contact, the design review process, and the land use expiration dates. Uh, so starting with the bicycle parking, uh, oh, I did wanna mention of those 16, most of those have both the temporary component and a permanent component to them. Uh, and the temporary component generally is looking at suspending or reducing the code for five years approximately. We put a sunset date of January 1st, 2029 into the code itself. Uh, so starting with uh, bicycle parking, uh, we've got a couple of uh, temporary uh, amendments and then one that is uh, more permanent. Uh, first off, our, we are looking at reducing the required long-term bicycle parking for multi-dwelling development or mixed-use projects that have residential units. Uh, currently, if you're in a close-in or downtown neighborhood, you're supposed to provide 1.5 bike parking spaces per unit. Uh, we're proposing to reduce that to 1.0. Uh, for areas in outer west and outer east, uh, that ratio is going from 1.1 to 0.7. Uh, another temporary change we are proposing is to remove the requirement for, and it says cargo bike requirements, but it's really to remove the requirement for the larger bikes, which often are those cargo bikes or bikes with baskets. Uh, that Those get triggered currently when a, there needs to be at least 20 long-term bike parking spaces, and then 5% are supposed to be uh, provided that uh, are of a size that can adapt to those larger, larger bikes. Uh, there has been some comments from developers about sort of being caught off guard with that large requirement and having to potentially, that impacts the bike room. So we're looking at uh, five year uh, temporary uh, suspension of that requirement. And then uh, a permanent change we're looking at making is to remove some of the specific in unit standards for long term bike parking. Uh, we do allow up to 50% of bike parking to be placed in the unit, doesn't always, not all of it has to be in common bike rooms. Uh, but we had, <coughs> as part of the bike parking project that went into effect a 
about three years ago, uh, we had quite a few standards about where they should go and, and how they're mounted, and, and uh, that was another thing that we'd heard some feedback on. And so we are permanently reducing the requirement that it be in an alcove and the requirement about its proximity to the front door. So that will allow for a little more flexibility about where that, that bike space can go in the unit. Uh, the next thing I want to talk about is with ground floor active uses. Um, th there are several ways that we address the uh, looking at trying to require ground floor active uses. This usually applies to some of our mixed use zones and especially in some of our plan districts and overlay zones where we are trying to get uh, uh, an insurance that we get commercial uses in some of these areas. Uh, and so in these cases, we're generally proposing uh, temporary ch uh, suspensions. Uh, in some places, we do require that a percentage of the ground floor be set up for specific uses, and we're proposing to suspend that requirement. So some, like the Main Street overlay zone says 25% of your uh, floor area in a certain, within 100 feet of the transit street has to be in one of these lists of uses. And so we are suspending that uh, if they're providing residential uh, development. Uh, similar types of requirements uh, occur in our central city and in our um, in a couple of our other plan districts and so we are also waiving that as well. Uh, in addition we do have some design requirements that require while they don't require necessarily that there be a, a use they do require that the ground floor be designed in a way that they can accommodate more active commercial office uses. Uh, and we are also looking at suspending that, those requirements in uh, many of our plan districts with the exception of Central City. The feeling with Central City was that there's still an importance in having that ability for the ground floor to be able to uh, uh, have the, have the uh, conversion to commercial or to be able to have the space for commercial uses. Uh, once again, most of these things apply only when there's uh, residential development proposed. So if it's uh, completely, if it's uh, an office building entirely with no residential, they would still have to meet these criteria. Uh, the third one we have here, uh, there are some of our plant districts where we require a percentage of ground floor window that is higher than what is required in our base zones. And we are proposing to suspend that higher requirement. And so just the base zone requirements would apply. Um, I do admit these are get kind of technical, but uh, they are things that, that people identify when they're trying to uh, develop projects. Uh, this next slide kind of addresses uh, eco roofs and bird safe glazing. We're, we're, these are more central city focused. Uh, in both of these cases, uh, we are suspending the, any requirements uh, that trigger when an eco roof needs to be put in or when a building needs to provide bird safe glazing. Eco-roof requirements only apply to development in the central city. Uh, bird safe glazing applies in the central city and in uh, some of the river overlay zones. So those will be suspended for five years. Uh, but we are making a clarification, uh, a permanent clarification uh, regarding spandrel glass. And that, once again, is a kind of a technical fix, but that was something that was identified in the regulatory improvement uh, packages. And uh, so we're clarifying that spandrel glass, because of its reflective properties, should also be considered glazing for that. Uh, the next one I wanted to go over was neighborhood contact. This is more of a process, kind of takes us into more of the process improvements. Uh, currently, certain projects are required to uh, uh, engage in a neighborhood contact process. This can range from just posting a site with a poster board to potentially holding a meeting. Um, by the developer to, in some cases, having to coordinate with the neighborhood association to hold the neighbor uh, the uh, meeting. Uh, we have a couple changes we're proposing on this. Uh, first off, once again, if a project has residential uses, we are suspending all the neighborhood contact requirements. Um, this does not necessarily mean if they were going through a land use review that they they would still have to do the needed notice for that. But the neighborhood contact, which often occurs before the building permit and before the land use review, that will be suspended for five years. And then the second option we're doing is we're simplifying the neighborhood contact options. Uh, currently, uh, there's three options. The third option was something that was added during city council hearings. It kind of nests in between the other two options, and that's the one where uh, the developer has to give the neighborhood association first right of refusal to hold the, the meeting before they can decide to hold the meeting. It's, it kind of adds a couple extra steps and some added confusion. 
uh, we're proposing to just reduce it back down to the two options, which was what was originally proposed, which is certain size projects post the site, larger projects post the site and hold, and the developer holds a meeting. This is another process item, and this is, has to do with uh, projects that are going through design review. Um, if a project either requ is required to go through a discretionary design review or elects to go through a design, uh, discretionary design review, um, there's different levels of design review depending on the size of the project. Uh, a type three process triggers a pre-application conference uh, and, a, and a public hearing. Uh, type two processes are a staff level uh, process, but then uh, can be appealed to the, the design commission. During the design overlay zone amendments, which a couple folks on this panel were um, involved in, we provided an opportunity for uh, applicants of, uh, uh, of uh, affordable housing, if they were normally going to go through the type three process, they could choose to go through a type two process instead, with the caveat that they would go through what's known as a design advice request with the Design Commission before applying for that type two process. What we're proposing here is to expand that to all projects that have housing. So if a project has housing, it would normally trigger this type three design review that triggers the pre-application conference and a hearing, then they could elect to go through the type two process as long as they ha held the uh, DAR with the Design Commission beforehand. Similarly, if a project would normally go through a type two process and is, has housing, we're uh, allowing uh, an applicant to elect to go through a type 1X process. The main difference between these is the type 1X process does not have a local appeal. So once again, if I think if a developer feels comfortable with, with meeting the approval criteria and, the, and is working with staff to get to that, that kind of saves some time at the, at the back end of that and also provides a little more uh, certainty that a neighbor or someone won't be appealing it because the appeal would have to go to the state. Thank you, I'm um, Commissioner Spivak for the record. Um, I'm thinking ahead to the January 1st, 2029 date when these things sunset. And for design requirements, it makes, it's pretty straightforward. Like you have to get your permits, I assume, accepted for intake before the sunset date. For some of these process ones, it's just not as intuitive to me. And maybe, it, I, for example, if you, you, you have a choice between a type two with a, or a type three process, when do you make that choice and how do you how do you vest your thing before you lose the opportunity on January 1st or with neighborhood contact? Um, it's, a, it's a fluid thing. Like I'm guessing that if you're applying on January 5th, then you better have done your neighborhood contact before that because it's an effect. So I guess that's one of the things because we say that it, neighborhood contact is not applicable, but really it is if you're gonna be applying after the date. So I just don't know if this comes up in the code, but I could see there being confusion from users as they're about to, they're trying to figure out what, what do they have to do to vest? That's what they're gonna figure out. And maybe that's already covered elsewhere in the code, but for me, it was not obvious in this. Well, the code is clear that you're vested in the day that you apply for your permit. So if you come in for your permit February 1st, and it's already expired, February 1st of 2029, is that our date? So, so the vesting applies to either a land use application or a building, or a building permit. permit. So whatever, yeah. Right. Right. So if you, yeah, so if you want to avoid, if you have, if you want to go through the type 1X and not go through the type 2, you would have to go in before January 1st, 2029. Um, the neighborhood contact is a little bit more, is a little different because that technically applies before anything is vested. And so that is something that as that date approaches, there'll probably have to be some public outreach um, just from BDS's standpoint. They, I believe they had to go through a similar kind of situation as the neighborhood contact process got developed because uh, once again, the, the neighborhood contact rules are really not that old. So I think in, in 2018 or 2019, when those got created, they, they had to sort of say, hey, this rule's gonna be in place. So if you're gonna apply for this permit as of this date, you should already do this neighborhood contact. So I think it's gonna be a similar thing. All right, thank you. And I believe this is the last one I'm gonna, I'm gonna go over. Uh, this is actually a, a, a permanent change. Um, and this involves with uh, land use reviews and uh, their expiration dates. Uh, our standard uh, time period from when a land use review is approved to when you need to get your building permits issued, historically has been three years. 
And so generally, if, if you get an approval for a design review or get an approval for a conditional use review, you have three years to get your permit issued. Or if it's, say, a conditional use review, you have to at least start your operations by that. Um, during the COVID pandemic and, that, and so on, we, uh, there was a temporary measure that allowed reviews within a certain time frame to have up until January 1st of this upcoming year, 2024, to get those issued. That, of course, is going to sunset. <clears throat> and what we decided was that it's probably better rather than to try to keep messing with you know, temporary dates and so on. Uh, I think we felt comfortable in just expanding that three-year time frame up to five years. Uh, we are also putting in a provision so that if somebody is, you know, has a review that's, that's already going through, um, that they submitted before this date becomes effective, or we've got a provision that sort of backdates that so that if somebody, you know, came in a couple years ago, they would have still five years. So uh, that's one thing we did just to, to kind of ensure there's, you know, with the economy and, and some of the issues with financing right now, there is some concern about getting, uh, getting the permits uh, out and issued in time. And so this is hopefully to provide a little relief to that. So this is something that uh, we bring with every legislative project, but uh, and we'll probably bring this slide again uh, when we when we uh, present on the on the twenty fourth. But uh, you know, we're going to be looking for the planning commission to come in and and make a recommendation to adopt the report and to amend uh, the zoning code as the proposed draft is written and or as it's amended, depending on what we uh, what we have during our discussion with you. I think Sandra already get, went through this a little bit, but um, just to reiterate, uh, the proposed draft went out last week. Um, we're going to have the planning commission hearing in a month, and we're hoping to get to city council in December, uh, depending on, on their holiday schedule. And uh, I think with that, we're all done, so we're open it for questions. Thank you so much for that overview. I do have a few questions to kick us off. On the ground floor active use, um, question around future ability to convert to commercial so if we have this temporary um, relief from that requirement outside of the central city and say 15 years down the road it's a building located in a you know neighborhood center and there's a desire to convert to either live work or commercial uh, taking some of those residential units online would that offline would that be allowable Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. So it does maintain that mm -hmm. um, use permitted right. Right, in the building, right. it, even it if is. they're built out 100% residential based on this temporary relief. The only thing, the, the thing that, you know, of course, the zoning code doesn't address is, is whether there's building code issues. So right. if they design the ground so floor, conversion, if they yes. design the ground floor in a way that doesn't have great, you know, Right, you might have to make some upgrades, yeah. accessibility, other, other codes might apply to that conversion. Right, I right. But commissioners, I'm sorry. I just wanted to jump in really quickly, Patricia Defender, for the record. So, yes, I think that's why. Actually, we kind of went fast over all the the different recommendations. But as Phil was explaining, we have in different parts of the city we have regulations that both limit or require the kinds of uses that can be on the ground floor, and also have provisions that specify to what standards those ground floors have to be built. In the as a, as a way to just generally create more flexibility, I think there's we're we're proposing a couple of different things, and we're proposing different treatment in the central city versus the rest of the city. So, across the board, the the objective is to temporarily relax the the restrictions on what kind of uses can be on the ground floor. So, across the board, whether you're in central city or outside of central city. Where there, where there are regulations today that would specify you have to have only these uses or you can't have dwelling units or residential units on the ground floor, that would be suspended. So you can do dwelling units on the, on the ground floor, for example. In, this, in the central city, there, there's you know, a desire to retain the adaptability of these spaces over time. And so the proposal involves retaining the, the standard of the higher ground floors in the central city, but actually proposes to relax that standard outside of the central city. The trade-off in, in my estimation being that it 
it's, you know, it's about flexibility, but it's also about cost. And if, if affordability is also our objective, then I think we have to make some concessions. Um, and I, I, you know, from my perspective, being more flexible about the design of the space um, and the use of, you know, particularly the design of the space outside of Central City, I think is, is an acceptable trade-off. Whereas within Central City, um, I think, you know, there's, there's sort of consensus that it would be good to retain that adaptability over time. Um, another thing that is, is probably, I think, in this briefing, helpful to convey to you so that when you hear testimony in the upcoming public hearing, you also have a, a sense of these are temporary measures, as we've said. What we're hoping to do is learn from the experience of what happens during these temporary, uh, you know, as these temporary measures are um, taken advantage of. But also, we've been talking about more more broadly after this uh, this project, looking at with a little bit more dis discernment about where these rules apply, so that when they come back, you know, when they come back into effect after this temporary period, if we are applying it too broadly in too many places, particularly in the central city, is where where we're you know there's some thought that it might be applied in too many areas. We would in the intervening time do another process uh, to look at the map in Central City and where these are applied and think about can we reduce those areas a little bit. Not to sacrifice our other objectives, but just to be, again, in the vein of creating a little bit more flexibility. So the other thing that I think is important to convey to, to you all is the, the items that Phil highlighted are items that we're raising up to you because there are different constituencies out there who will have concerns about those things and you're going to hear potentially you're going to hear testimony about people who are going to be expressing concern about suspending those rules for this intervening time and we want you to be able to understand the rationale like where the impetus for this project came from what we're trying to accomplish in this moment in time to be responsive to the housing crisis and the mandates that are likely to come from the state um, and and also to just put in context what you're going to hear in the in the public hearing and I, I'll stop there because I know others have their hands up. Thank you so much. Um, on the neighborhood notice requirements, will the applicant contact information still be listed on the site signage, or is that going to be removed? So, the, well, the site signage posting for right. the neighborhood contact is is going to be suspended for five years. Oh, I thought yeah. that would that would stay in place. So there would still be the development notice sign on the site, but what what would not happen anymore is the neighborhood meetings. Yeah, no, both both versions, I mean, because neighborhood contact one is if, if something's sort of between 10 and 25,000 square feet is usually the, the window. Uh, okay. They post, but they don't have to hold a meeting. Okay. Um, if they're going through a land use review, there would still be um, the ability for, you know, there'd still be potential posting for certain things and also noticing mailed out and and the, uh, the planner that's reviewing the land use review would be the contact for that. Right. But and this kind of takes away that sort of developer communication piece that, that was happening okay. ahead of time. And under the land use processes, would there still be notice sent to neighborhood association land use co-chairs? Yeah. Okay. Okay, thank you. Um, I see Commissioner Lang, then Vice Chair Pouncil, and then Vice Chair Thompson. Thank you, and uh, thanks for the presentation. I appreciate that. I, in my previous life, I ran into all of these issues before, and and I understand the uh, the need to do this to help kind of spur some more development. As as was said in the previous presentation, uh, a lot of the housing depends on outside investors coming in, and these can be hurdles to that kind of investment. So. Thank you very much for that. I was just curious, and I, I'm pretty sure I understand this five-year period. After that five years, if you don't do the uh, the bike parking or you, you take advantage of this, does that, after five years, does that property fall into nonconformance and you might be asked to now put your, your two bike per unit ratio back into that building or is that 
any building built within this time frame, they are exempt and, and kind of protected going forward. Well, specific to specific to long-term bike parking, I mean, generally that is an issue where if something is meeting a development, you know, is, is using a, a waiver or suspension and that goes away, say with the ground floor window requirements, they would be non-conforming. Uh, many of these provisions that we're putting in, though, are not things that get triggered as requiring improvement. Um, so in other words, if somebody didn't quite meet the ground floor window percentage for that uh, central city or the main street, and they were coming in for a tenant improvement 10 years later, unless they were doing something with that exterior work with the windows where they should come in closer to conf uh, compliance, they would not get uh, required to bring that up to compliance. Bike parking, long-term bike parking is a little bit different uh, because bike parking is one of the items that we list under the non-conforming upgrades, but long-term bike parking does not get triggered unless a project is going through a major remodel, which has specific thresholds in terms of uh, a higher amount, a dollar amount. It's based on the assessed value and or if you're adding a big chunk of uh, square footage to your property. I think it's, if you're adding 50%, you know, if you had a 20,000 square foot building and you're adding another 10,000 square feet, then that could potentially trigger that. The reason why the long-term bike parking was, was triggered with the major remodel is because the thought was that investment's probably more significant. Long-term bike parking oftentimes is required to be in a secure area and if you know if you don't have a parking lot or a fenced off area, it probably would have to go in the building. You'd have to accommodate that. So we wanted it to only get triggered when there's a larger scale remodel. And is mechanical uh, upgrades is that exempt from from that trigger? It's well, it's a dollar amount. It's there's certain things in there that are that don't don't get triggered. I think it's you know, sort of permanent improvements. I don't know if, you know, some mechanical equipment does factor into the building permit value and some factors, some of it doesn't. Thank you very much. Commissioner Lang, uh, Patricia Diefendorfer, I just wanted to um, note that your question is a good one about if, if people take advantage of these provisions now, would we be creating a non-conforming situation down the line that somebody will ultimately have to resolve. And I, I think we should talk about that and look into that a little bit more. Yeah, we can clarify that more, but maybe a different way of saying what Phil was saying is that it's like of, of these 16 items, what would need to be resolved? Obviously the process items do not need to be resolved. You, you'll go through a type two design review, you later don't have to come through a type three in the future. So all of those would be off the table. Most of the items in the development um, of our 16 items are not on the list of things that are required to be upgraded in the, fu in the future. So um, as Phil was describing, bike parking is on the list, but with some long-term bike parking with some caveats. But other things on that list are um, perimeter, um, l perimeter and interior parking lot landscaping. We're not waiving that with this requirement. Screening of mechanical equipment. Um, um, pedestrian walkways, those, that list is a very finite list of I think eight standards and most of them we're not touching except for the bike parking. Um, so we can describe more about the bike parking and how that would work out in the future. Thank you. Uh, Vice Chair Pouncil, please go ahead. Okay, yeah, thank you. Um, uh, I'm gonna leave my, I'm having uh, uh, connectivity issues. So I'm gonna leave my camera off. I apologize for that. Um, so I have a, a two questions and a, and a clarifying question. And so my my first question is um, for the bicycle parking. There's already, if I'm correct on this, is there already a state law that actually says there has to be bike parking per unit in each new construction am i correct on that well at the state level there is currently the climate friendly and equitable communities or cfec uh, rulemaking that's going on uh, that rulemaking is being amended as we speak and i think huh. they're, they're going to be going through a process uh, later this fall 
and they are suggesting that the, there be a requirement, I believe, of one space per unit, uh, and that we can potentially propose other uh, amounts or provide opportunities for adjustments. Uh, one of the things that uh, that c specific uh, state rule uh, won't be uh, in effect until the city ha updates their uh, transportation system plan, and so there's sort of a delay before that has to be implemented. It's not something that has to be implemented with some of the other uh, rules from that. Uh, but that is something we're keeping our eye on, uh, just to, to verify, because while while most of the area, you know, even with the reduction goes to, you know, would meet that criteria, the outer areas, we're proposing a temporary um, ratio that's a little bit under that. But current, but to clarify also, currently there is no state requirement that there be bike parking on, on site. Okay, all right, so, thanks for yes. that. And and was there any um, communication with um, the uh, 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 bicycling community and advocacy groups on this um, decision or um, or a, you know, for the regulatory relief uh, mm -hmm. project, was there, you know, about the temporary suspension, was there any communication or yeah, so this is a little unusual project because we've asked Phil to move very quickly so we could get to city council by December. Um, and to his credit, he's been getting the word out as well as he can. Um, and that's one of the reasons why we're here a month before the hearing so we could let you know what was happening. We've been to several groups, the Home Builders Association, Oregon Smart Growth. We're going to the um, Central East Side Industrial Council. We've sent out blog posts and pushed this on social media. Um, we have seen um, a letter coming in from the Street Trust on, so we know that they're aware. I see um, Commissioner Routh uh, nodding her head um, about it. So I think people are aware, um, and that's what um, Patricia was alluding to. We th we're pretty sure the word is out there on the project and that people will be testifying um, um, at, on the 24th. And we've, we've targeted okay. notice to, to some folks that we know have a specific interest in that. And I do want to also mention that we were working directly with uh, PBOT, Portland Transportation, and their, their, their folks that developed the bicycle uh, regulations. Uh, and they actually, at their meeting, I think, with the Bicycle Advisory Committee before we even had this um, proposal publicized at all, they had, had mentioned to the Bicycle Advisory Committee that they were going to uh, be in support of uh, proposing these ratios and and these rule uh, these amendments. So I think that uh, kind of made out there. I think uh, uh, Bike Portland actually had potentially an article about that uh, based upon that meeting. Yeah, um, Patricia Stephendorfer, for the record, I can confirm that PBOT did have a conversation with the Bicycle Advisory Committee on this. So the the community is aware aware of that and it is likely that we will hear from them. Okay, fantastic. Okay, and then, my, then my, the clarifying question that I had was on the the bird glazing. So when you say glazing, are, are you saying uh, glass or actual the glazing that holds the window in place? <laughs> I was a little bit confused on, on that. Uh, you know, so are, are we talking about glass itself? Yeah, it's the actual it's actual glass the the, the, okay. the provision that you know basically provides a it, reflective property. Yeah, and there's, okay, there's thanks for that. Requirements and then for and then my my yeah. my my question is actually, was there any communication with um, you know, you know, like uh, Audubon or you know any any you know uh, birding groups or whatever? Um, I mean, I know this this much that you know. Last year, there was over a billion birds that were killed from running into glass windows, and most of those are low story. They're not high rise buildings. You know, half half of them actually are, you know, low rise buildings, um, and then residential. So, um, I, I just want you know, we're we're already dealing with you know um, some issues with our wildlife, and uh, uh, so you know, I, I think that we should you know try to. You know, I don't know. I, there, there's just some concern about getting rid of something like that for, you know, personally. Um, and so um, I, I just would like to know that there's some good data or some good, you know, investigation behind 
why we would get rid of that, even if it's temporary for five years. I think that you know uh, our, our ecology deserves a, a little bit more than that. But uh, but yeah, nonetheless, th thanks and I appreciate it. And, and I have been, I have tried to be a little more proactive in getting, I mean, we didn't have a mailing list, we didn't have a stakeholder list, but I did uh, send out emails and, and, and requests for folks to get on our, on our EMMA list, and I sent them directly to folks with Audubon and with Willamette River Keepers um, with the idea that uh, as soon as they would see that, they would, they would uh, get on board to, to potentially, you know, review and testify on that. Um, one of the things that, that we were having to balance on this, and this is why it's, I think, a temporary measure, was the provisions that were in the survey. And, and some of these things were, were identified as, as potential barriers because of their cost. And, and you know, eco roofs and bird safe glazing do add a small amount of cost and, and, and these incremental costs. And I think we'll probably, we're trying to work up some more information on that. But we're trying to balance this idea of, you know, maybe pulling some of these costs out while not completely abandoning the policy. And that's why the idea of it being a temporary measure and, and essentially being something that would automatically go back into effect on January 1st, 2029, um, that gives us maybe a little bit more time to, to see what the effect is and see if there's a better way of, of addressing this. And I think as we discussed in your last meeting, it's also, you know, this moment in time where we have a housing crisis and the city is doing everything that we can and we um, to increase housing production. And we've asked the development community what that would look like. Um, and we heard from them. And this is um, kind of implementing um, what we heard from those communities. Not to say that those the policies that we had that we had established earlier um, aren't good policies that we would want to continue. Um, that's why we landed on the temporary five-year five year, um, proposal as being the way to go. Thank you, Vice Chair Thompson, and then Commissioner Routh. Well, thank you, Sandra and Phil. I know that you've been moving very quickly on this. I did have some similar questions and concerns to those uh, brought up by Commissioner uh, Pouncil. I just wanted to better understand the community groups that had been notified of these changes and wanted to um, request if it's not too much work at our next session, if we could have like a list or a slide that um, includes the names of those community groups. When I was looking at the proposal, um, the, bi the bike stakeholder group that originated the code that we have now was mentioned, so making sure they were included. We've already talked about that. Um, we've talked about Audubon and some of the others. I also just wanted to bring this back to like the climate justice um, conversation that had been so central to some of the work that we'd been doing for the past few years and ask about build shift and some of the other community groups that have been working really hard in the housing space. Um, very curious to hear some testimony from those entities as well. So if there's anything that um, we can do as commissioners to um, help with the outreach to like lesser lessen your burden, um, please don't hesitate. Um, I'm, I'm happy to help in any way that I can. Um, and then I just um, wanted to just high level the time for any potential amendments will come, but I think it's really, really important for us to always be thinking long-term. And I know that there's um, there's crises in front of us and, and sometimes I feel like we can be a little bit reactive um, in one direction or the other. And I think that with all of the things that have put been put forward um, as potential changes here, they're not all created equal. You know, like the ability of a neighbor to stymie or delay a housing project um, is not great tomorrow and it's not gonna be great in 25 years. So I feel like, boom, that checks the long-term box. But the ecological health um, bird populations, uh, that really starts to concern me. And I think that when we look at where that ranked on the developer survey, which was very low in priority compared to some of these process improvements and the bike storage, I'm concerned um, that that's not a worthy trade-off. Um, I'm also really concerned about removing the eco roof requirement. 
um, very, very hesitant to do that. Um, I didn't see that come up. I'm not sure if it just wasn't included on the developer survey or it wasn't a priority, but the I'm assuming that BES is still going to require all stormwater to be managed on site. And the other ways of doing that, like via drywall and things like that, they don't offer the same sorts of climate and ecosystem benefits that green roofs do. And green roofs are not that much more expensive than installing like a drywall underneath the building. So I that's another one where I'm just like, I think we need to take the long-term view. And yes, some of these things do add cost, but let's not you know, throw the baby out with the bath water there. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Thompson pretty much said everything I was going to say. <laughs> but um, uh, uh, Phil, Sandra, I also really appreciate, I know that we are in a housing crisis and I feel um, we, if we say we are in a housing emergency, it is an emergency and uncomfortable things need to be on the table. Um, all, these are really uncomfortable for me. I think the the bike bike parking absolutely is. Uh, I think of uh, our, you know, our carbon emissions and that we want people to be biking. And, you know, we have been talking about families and childcare um, previously and housing needs analysis. How does, uh, creating bike cargo capacity and making sure people don't have to huff that up a set of stairs is a is a big deal. So I know I have strong immediate reactions to that. Um, I share uh, Commissioner Thompson and I believe Bike Vice Chair Pouncil's um, uh, appreciation, and that that I'm happy to reach out to others as well. I'll be sitting with this um, for some weeks and uh, and I appreciate how hard this is. Um, yeah, and I'm looking forward to a robust conversation <laughs> because it is an emergency and also there are downstream impacts and there are, I think of, uh, sorry, last, I'm rambling a bit, but um, uh, looking at the bird glazing, I just think like, what would, if uh, Mike Houck were still on planning commission, what would he be saying? And uh, and I think that reaching back out to him is uh, would be a worthy endeavor, and I'll I'll commit to doing that. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you. I do want to clarify that just because the city is not requiring it doesn't mean that the developer can't provide it. So, with the lower bike parking ratios, for example, a developer could provide more bike parking. Just because we don't require eco roofs doesn't mean that the development community can't put in an eco roof. So just um, want to make sure that that's clear um, to you all, that it's not a prohibition against those things. It's just that we're not requiring those things for this temporary um, period of time. Commissioners, um, Patricia Diefendefer, I just also want to add a couple of other observations related to the, the items, um, particularly the bird glazing and the eco roof. So. Just want to put out there, similar to what I was describing um, about the ground floor uses and and uh, design standards. I think in this intervening time, we would also look at those provisions with an eye to are there ways to achieve those outcomes, perhaps differently and perhaps in ways that are that are more cost effective. So, I think just to allay some concern, hopefully a little bit. If, if you know if we do these things on a temporary basis there's a few of these that we definitely have identified that we want to explore for for when the permanent rules uh, come back are there other ways that we can be achieving the again achieving those objectives in in ways that are that are perhaps a little bit different or, or cost effective or create more flexibility uh, I've, I've had a couple, I've had conversations with different people about both of those and that there are ways to do to do that, to either be more flexible or to um, achieve those objectives in a more cost effective way. So I just want to also put that out there as something to, to factor in when we're thinking about the, when we're deliberating on these in the future. Um, Commissioner Spivak, for the record. Um, I sometimes do the nitty gritty. So these are gonna be big discussion topics for us as a whole. I've gone through about half the project and found some a few places where I just don't understand it or I thought there may be a loophole created. Um, 
perhaps I should just send those over ahead of time so you guys can see if I'm misreading it or something like that. So because it seems like they'll have a lot to discuss on the actual policy issues later. Yeah. And, and I guess it look also looking through it, it seems like this project captures actually quite a few things beyond the list that was done in the summary. Conditional use zones, parking evaluation. Um, I'm actually kind of cheering the idea that maybe some stuff got in this project that otherwise would have been a recap. I'm not sure if that's happened, but um, I like I like when stuff gets done when there's an opportunity to do it, um, especially when it's unlikely to be contentious. So um, thank you for doing that. And for all the times that I've been accused of scope creep, I think staff did a little extra on this project too. Thanks. Yeah, I would encourage you all to send us emails and let us know what your questions are because when, when we come back on October 24th, we can address those ahead of time. If there are enough questions we think everyone would be interested in, we could even do a memo ahead of time um, letting you know, you know the answers to those so you can digest the information um, you know, a ahead of hearing the public testimony and reading the public testimony. We are using um, the MAP app um, as our repository for public testimony as we just sent out the notices, I think, on last week. And so um, I don't think there are any pieces of testimony there, but you should start. We do? Oh, we, too, we have two pieces of testimony um, just today. So um, y you should start taking a look at that, and we appreciate that. And um, I think the hearing will be a great opportunity to learn more from the public. Thank you so much. My, my additional comment, this is Chair O'Meara for the record. To the extent that there can be data on the actual costs that are added, because personally, I've never heard the glazing be an issue in any of my developments. It's never it's never once come up as a, as a cost driving issue. Um, similarly with eco roofs, the only reason that's been a concern is because we need really good roof capacity for solar infrastructure. So it's never been really a cost. It's been more of the solar infrastructure need. So to the extent possible, and I know some of this is coming in right via survey where it's a bit anecdotal, but if there is an ability to say, you know, we've looked into this and, and glazing can range, you know, 15% increase on, on windows, right, as an example. I think that sort of data is really going to help um, with justification of, of are these really cost drivers on projects and to what extent? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we'll, we'll definitely share that. There's some that studies my done from when, the, when those rules were passed. Great, thank you. Okay, yes, go ahead, Commissioner Patel. Commissioner Patel, for the record, I just had one brief clarifying question. Since we were talking about, uh, we had a hearing and a briefing on housing needs analysis uh, today, did that capacity analysis um, include the suspension of? No. No. Okay. You read. Yeah. No, no, no. <laughs> so that's a, uh, yeah. so the, the numbers are arguably underestimated, could be, um. in the event that this is passed. Patricia Diefender, for the record, I, I would say that the numbers, the capacity numbers don't change based on this. I mean, the capacity numbers have a methodology by which we, that was explained how we determine the capacity, the zoning capacity within our land uses. This is dealing more with the economics of the moment and trying to just remove barriers. I don't think it changes the overall capacity, it might, hopefully, it'll it'll change our actual production. Like, we'll actually see greater right. production, but it, it won't change our zoning capacity numbers, if that makes sense. Yeah, that does. Yeah. That does. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much for that overview. And with that, I will go ahead and adjourn our meeting today. Have a great evening, everyone. <laughs>